medical, legal, and well-being. I'm going to do medical, legal, and then well-being tomorrow. The reason being is we segued into medical, legal last class. So who wants to tackle a question? Okay, you ready? What is the name of the certifying agency that you have to get through in order to be an EMT? The, the certifying agency, the entity that will test you to give you certification. Don't remember, who wants to help? Okay. The NREMT. NREMT stands for? National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians. It's a registry, it's a database. You, you right now could go to that website without even logging in and do a public search and put my name in there and it should come up. I hope it comes up, okay? And uh, it'll tell you me, it'll tell you if I'm active or expired, so that's awesome. Uh, one of these days I'll see your name in there, right? Probably around January at the latest, I'll see your name in that registry. Um, next question, who wants it? Sure. Does that allow me or you to practice in the state of Texas? No. How come? And what do they give you? A license. A license, yes. A license is issued by the state. I have the license, I have my national registry. Can I go to work? Only in Texas. That's true, but can I go to practice medicine now in Texas? Not without a medical director. Not without a medical director. And what is a medical director? Can you give me a Webster definition of medical director? Someone that's able to push meds. Someone that's able to push meds? Somebody who has a uh, license of a doctor. So if he has his PhD in literary science, does that work? You go to him if you got administered from the patient's head to come in that school. Okay, so that's about where we left off. So that the answers are starting to kind of get a little floaty on me. So let's clear that up a little bit. MD or DO, MD or DO, doctor of chiropractic won't work. Not that I have anything against doctors of chiropractic. They just will not work in this capacity because they don't provide that type of care, okay? A doctor philosophy won't work. It has to be an MD or DO. We're gonna get into legal today where people are gonna arrive on scene and say, hey, I'm a doctor, I can help. We'll talk about how we deal with those volunteer doctors that appear on our scenes. Um, they have to be licensed in the state of Texas. Here's a question you will not find in the textbooks, and I doubt you'll find an answer for this in the textbook. So I'm gonna throw it out there and see what you think. Does that medical director, that MD or DO, must they specialize in emergency medicine? No. You don't think so. So you would be making a list today on a piece of paper that says what I think I know versus now what I know. Remember me talking about that? So that would be on your list, wouldn't it? You don't think they have to be. Is that what I heard? So um, somebody who's board certified in obstetrics and gynecology, could they be a medical director for an EMS agency? I got some of these kind of yeah, looks back there. Back. Huh? I think I take my answer back. Do you think you take your answer back? Can someone board certified in family practice? Can someone board certified in emergency medicine? Now that seems absolute, doesn't it? Can a trauma surgeon? Those things sound absolute, don't they? You could be board certified in family practice, gynecology, ophthalmology, oncology, or you could not be board certified at all, just be a, phys a licensed physician and you can still serve as a medical director. Does that bother you? Yes. Why does that bother you? Because the gynecologist is not ideal. Unless you're delivering emergency childbirth in the field, right? Right. But that's what the state says. That's how the rules are written. Certainly yes, they can. Any licensed medical doctor or doctor of osteopath, MD or DO, can do it. Dentist can't, but you get the point now, right? Should they have met you 
if you're going to go to work for that agency and that agency's medical director is Dr. Lewis, and I'm throwing his name out there because Dr. Lewis is one of the medical director directors for this program at Grayson, along with Dr. Keelan. You'll meet Dr. Keelan tomorrow. They are also medical directors for EMS agencies. Okay. Um, should you, if you go to work for that EMS agency, should you have met the medical director? I think so, but that's not a rule. Be nice. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? I'd like to know who I'm working under. And if I was the physician, I'd like to know who's working under me. But I'll just tell you, there are some medical directors in the state, maybe down in Houston, Austin, who have like 50 and 100 EMS agencies. It's lucrative. They make money. They get paid for it. But what are they accepting in that lucrative um, annual salary? Responsibility. Responsibility. New term alert. Who's, who, who was my new term person? Oh, Phyllis, right? <laughs> we're, we're recorded, so that's not your name anyway, right? We don't know who Phyllis is. I know. Um, you're going to go to work for this medical director. They have to give you permissions to work, okay? They also establish what you can do. So we're going to get into a lot of new terms here, okay? The state of Texas is called a delegated practice state. That's the new term. Delegated practice. There's a lot of pieces here that are about to fit together, okay? So bear with me. We're going to get some definitions out, and then we're going to make them all together, and then we'll summarize this. Delegated practice. That medical director delegates what you can do. So you arrive on scene, you got XYZ condition, this is what I want you to do for it. This is what I want you to do for it, and this is as far as you can go with it. Do you see two ends develop there? This is what you can do, this is as far as you can go. Boundaries. Let's use an example. You come up on someone as an EMT and they're profusely bleeding. What do I want you to do? Stop the bleeding. And I'll even tell you what tools I want you to stop it with. Direct pressure, tourniquet, blah, blah, blah. EMT. I probably will not allow you to <coughs> suture, hang blood, start an IV, blah, blah, blah. That, you with me? You got a limit. You see the limit? What you have to do, which is the minimum, what the cap is, that's the maximum. That has a new term as well. That term is called scope of practice. It's, it, it's, it's either really big or really small, depending on what you're doing and what your certification level is. Another new term, national EMS standards. National EMS standards. Generally recognized in the nation as the standards that must be performed at each certification level. So the, the national EMS standards are uh, the nationally recognized things, if you will, that you're expected to do as an EMT or paramedic or advanced EMT or EMR. Who, who, who dials that in? Who dials that scope of practice in to fit the local need and ability? The medical director does. So the medical director can look at the national standards and say, I want this, but I don't want that. Here's what I want. Let me write all this down for you. Let me put it in writing. Let me put my signature on it. New term alert. That in writing with signature book is called protocols. Protocols. So when you go to work for, and I'll just throw Bonham Fire Department out, just because we know where that's at, and you work under that medical director, you will be assigned 
your protocols that fit your certification level. Should you be familiar with them? Yes. I, I would hope so. I would hope so. Most protocols are similar across the board. Um, in Oklahoma, they're very similar. Oklahoma sets the protocols, and then the medical director dials it back. Texas, delegated practice state, they can adjust them pretty well to whatever they want to do. <coughs> Being a delegated practice state, could that physician ask you to do something that's maybe not in the standards? They can, but what are they doing when they do that? They're taking a risk, aren't they? They're taking a risk. Um, I'll be honest with you, the national standards include a lot more things than most medical directors will let you do. So just because it's in the standard doesn't mean you can do it. How come you can't do it? Don't have permission to do it. Where do I find the permissions? The medical director through his, his or her protocols. Everybody good so far? All right. So Reagan probably wants me to use the PowerPoint because he's going to have to edit this here in a little bit. And so I'm just kind of building a segue into what we're going to get into today. And that's where we left off the other day was with a medical director. Any questions about medical direction? No? What if you do something, what if you do something without their permission? You're risking yourself, aren't you? Uh, I can be more specific. You'd be practicing medicine without a license. That's a big no-no. This is not in the PowerPoint, so I'm going to address it here. This is the stuff you don't get out of the textbook, guys. Okay, this is why you got to come to class. This is why this is being recorded. You can sit in this class and learn some skills, and I hope, obviously, we hope you do. You can leave this class and get a diploma from the college. It says, congratulations. You now have earned a certificate of emergency medical technology. You walk across stage a cap and gown. But you haven't taken the national registry. You haven't applied to the state. You haven't worked for a medical director. But um, you feel like you're pretty good at this, so you go out there and you go to do something on somebody. Or you sign up for the local volunteer fire department and they run medical calls too. They kind of first respond and we'll go out here and we'll start care. That sounds good, doesn't it? There's a member of your community in need and you responded to them. They called and asked for help and you went and you started providing medical care. Are you in trouble? Have you violated a state rule? If you violated the law, <laughs> yes, yes, you're practicing medicine without a license. Be careful with that. We'll get into that here in a little bit. I think that will be in your column of, well, I thought, but now I know. All right. Uh, guys, look at that very first bullet point right there. This, this bullet point bothers me because you get through this chapter and you don't think about it anymore. And you think, well, nothing came up on that call. Nothing's weird about that call. That was pretty routine. And I packaged them, took them to the hospital, and let them go. That's, that's fine. There's nothing legal about this. No, every call has a legal component to it. As simple as the record keeping, all the way up to the level of what? Malpractice, negligence abandonment. Those are the things we'll talk about here in a little bit. By the way, I see a lot of you writing ferociously trying to get this before I go to the next slide. It is posted in Canvas to this morning, and it's under Module 1. So if you bring a laptop or a computer or a tablet or something and want to pull this up as we go through it, you're more than welcome to do that as well. It's in your Canvas shell. Um, who likes lawyers? You like lawyers? Are you a lawyer? Family member? If you need one, they are, right? If you're in trouble, you want a lawyer. If one of them serves you a subpoena because you're getting, or papers because you're getting divorced, you probably don't like the lawyer. 
I don't know anybody who's went through a divorce that likes lawyers. Even the one they hired. <laughs> you know, it's like, I didn't get enough. Um, most people don't like lawyers. And that's unfortunate because if you, like you said, if you need one, you need one. Um, who wants to go to court and testify? <clears throat> no show of hands. Uh, you've just increased your odds of doing so by taking this course. Sorry. What, your be what, what, what if you're not testifying about something you saw? What if you're having to testify about something you did or didn't do? Well, that's even stickier, isn't it? I'm not testifying as a witness. I'm testifying as the defendant. <laughs> it's like, oh, gosh, that's bad. Most people don't like to go into the court system. But it's part of society, and we have to do it. Um, and I will just to give you a little primer here. A lot of times it's two, three, four, five years within the statute of limitations, but it's usually within those, that five-year time frame that you may get subpoenaed to court. It takes a while to go through the system. You'll have to go, you could have to go to court and testify against something that you did or saw or witnessed four years ago, five years ago. You've made thousands of EMS calls since then. How are you going to spark your memory? Oh, right, if, 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 if it's not written down, it wasn't done. And we are super lax in this business about this. Because it just becomes so routine, we don't dot all that, all the I's across all the T's. Please be careful with this. Can I tell you a funny? I'm going to anyway. No, it's it's very serious. I have a I have a friend who's a paramedic in Plano Fire Department now, and he is he's he's been doing it as long as I have almost, and he's really really gifted as a paramedic. If my guts are on the sidewalk, I want him standing over me. He's that kind of guy, right? He can handle a chaotic scene, lots of common sense, lots of street smarts. I like the guy, love the guy. But I was reading one of his narratives one day, and that's what you do, you know, if you're riding with somebody, you take your partner and say, hey, will you take a look at this and make sure that everything in here is accurate? So I was looking at it, and I'm gonna use a little medical abbreviation here. PT stands for patient, not part-time. Now it stands for patient. Now, a patient was found. Everything good? Supine. What's supine mean? New word alert. On their back. What's the opposite? Well, if you're not on your back. I'm trying to think. You're on your belly. Yeah. Prone. Yeah. Prone. But this patient was found how? Supine. Supine. In? Road. Some of you got it. Some of you are like, what's the problem? What is the problem? We're not riding a horse, are we? Spell check is your enemy, guys. Should be that. Should be that. You think, well, okay, he misspelled a word. Let's go hypothetical. He got called to court because of how he managed this patient. They throw the transcript up on the overhead like behind me right now. There's his writing. Well, a couple of things here. I don't know about new spell check, but old spell check would let that go because it is spelled correctly. It's just in the wrong context. With the newer features now, that'll say, hey, you'll put a little blurb under it and go, you want to look at this word because it's not in context. Um, that is not your friend. I haven't tried this. Maybe somebody else can help us out. If I were you, I would turn off every spell check on every device you had, if possible. It is not exercising your brain to remember these words. From my own personal experience, my spelling has slipped. And a lot of this stuff doesn't recognize these abbreviations that we do. And um, some of the medical terms don't even really jive completely with spell check. We were doing it pen and paper, old school. 
he wrote that down like that. <coughs> My point is, if that was pulled up on an overhead in the courtroom and he was having to defend his character and tell everybody, I did the right thing, don't you think a defense attorney would look at that and go, you think this guy does the right thing? He can't even spell correctly. How do you get out or convict or any of that stuff in court systems? There's this thing called reasonable doubt, right? I only had to convince one. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, he looks like an idiot too. Great guy, great paramedic. They're going after his character now because they can't find anything else to get him on. Who likes lawyers? If you got that one on your side, you love him, but if not, it's the other way around. Every call has something, and even if something as simple as that could come back and bite you, and you'd be super embarrassed, wouldn't you? You're like, oh, God, why didn't I catch that? Please proofread. Please have someone else read your written reports. Don't rely on spell check. We talked about the scope of practice, did we not? One more time. That's the limit. I, I use an analogy of looking through a rifle scope. The stronger the rifle scope or the stronger the binoculars, the less field of view you have, right? That's a trade-off with optics. What do you see through your binoculars? What do you see through the rifle scope? And you can't get beyond those boundaries. If you do get beyond those boundaries, two words, new words, two words. If you fail to do what's in those, in that scope, if you fail to do what's in that scope, you have omitted something, haven't you? O-I-M-T, omit. Therefore, you have performed an act of omission. If you, if you were supposed to do something and you didn't do it, you omitted that. So it's an act of omission. If you step beyond the boundary and you did something that you weren't supposed to do, then you committed something. That's an act of commission. And that's going to come back into play here in a little bit when we try to build a legal case against you. Did you do what you were supposed to do, or did you do something you were not supposed to do? Did you fail to act, or did you act too much? Basically, it means, did you get outside your scope? Act of omission, act of commission. Clear on those two terms? And then the standard of care. And there's another phrase I want you to know here, and this is the most important phrase of today. The standard of care. There is a phrase I want you to associate with that. First, let's define it. The standard of care. National EMS standards, generally recognized across the nation, may be recognized across the state, fine-tuned by medical director. Everybody pretty good on that? Quick example, it's expected that from EMR to paramedic, if you find someone in cardiac arrest, you should do CPR. That's the standard of care for cardiac arrest, CPR. If you don't do it, you performed an act of? Omission. Omission. If you did open heart surgery, Omission. act of commission. Are you in trouble either way? Maybe. What I thought I knew <laughs> versus what I'm now gonna know. You may be doing that and not be in trouble. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Not all acts of omission or commission will get you in trouble. We'll talk about negligence shortly. The phrase I want you to put under here and a phrase I want you to carry through forever, reasonable and prudent. The, the concept is one of reasonable and prudent. P-R-U-D-E-N-T. Prudent. Well, what is that? Well, that is um, performing to the level that someone with equal training under same circumstances acting reasonably would do. Sometimes you can't meet the standard because the dog was too big and he was ferocious and you couldn't get to the patient and you backed out and you got in trouble for backing out, any reasonable and prudent person would run from that because the dog was so bad. 
can't get in trouble for that. It was an unsafe scene. That's a mild example. You did this to the patient and it wasn't the proper dosage. Why did you adjust the dosage? Well, I adjusted the dosage because I realized he had a liver issue. That happens on the paramedic side of life. Well, you didn't do what the protocol said to do. I adjusted it because any reasonable and prudent paramedic with the same or equal training under the same circumstances would have done the same thing. That's called expert witnesses. So you may be called as an EMT or paramedic to the courtroom to testify on your buddy's behalf or a peer. They probably wouldn't pull you if you were the buddy because you have some bias there, right? But you may get called in to be an expert witness and say, Mr. Drew, are you a paramedic? Yes, sir. How many years experience? Five years. Oh, the same as my client, huh? If you say so, sir. Do you understand the cases that's been unfolding? Yes, sir. What would you have done? Same thing. Would any, would any other paramedic with five years experience have done the same thing? I believe so. That seems reasonable and prudent. You, you following me? You don't want the expert witness up there going, I don't know who taught him, but that was the biggest joke I ever seen. I, there's no way I'd do anything like that. Jury's listening. Jury's listening. Are you following me on the concept of reasonable and prudent? So when you get into these legal sticky potholes, keep that in the back of your mind. What would anyone else do under the same circumstances? Would I do this to my family member or would I not do this for my family member? Would I want it done for me? You see those little tests we run on ourselves? Those are the ethical tests that we run. Okay, questions? Is it making sense? Do you see how it applies to you? Okay, good. We talked about the scope of practice already and establishes those boundaries and medical director does that. Cool. There's the model. It's a challenge for me, guys. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna adjust, but it's a challenge for me to use PowerPoint because I usually just let it flow. And uh, so we'll, we'll make it work, it'll be okay. I know a lot of times you like to see it in writing too, so you can spell the words and I get that. And I also have to understand I'm teaching a class that doesn't exist yet, so let's, let's help me out here. Please, please, please. We already talked about this. Did you do the right thing and did you do it properly? Can that be reasonable and prudent? Can you transcribe those words there? I did the right thing at the right time. Here's another phrase I want you to remember. In the best interest of the patient. Just burn that back there in the cloud bank somewhere. In the best interest of the patient. If you can prove to the courts and the jury that you acted in the best interest of the patient, that's a pretty much get out of jail free card. You can cash that one in. If it doesn't appear that way, oh, even if you've never done everything correctly and it doesn't appear that way, you can get in some sticky situations and we'll address those. New term alert. Is it Jordan? Yes. Okay. Jordan, new term alert. I've, I've, I've stuck you with Phyllis, and <laughs> you may just be you may just be Fifi for the rest of the class. Okay, um, you won't mind, will you? No. Okay. New term alert: duty to act. This is a this is a big one. This is probably on that list of what I thought I knew versus what I now know. Duty to act. A legal obligation. You can also call that a contractual obligation. Uh, let me pick on somebody here. Give me your name, Mr. Texas. Uh, Gus. Gus, how could I forget that? Mr. McCray, old Texas Ranger, you. Gus, let's, where'd you want to go to work at? What's your dream job? Firefighter. Where? Anywhere. No, it can't just be anywhere. No, it can't be. I promise you it just can't be. Do better than that. Uh, Colorado. 
Denver? No, I don't know. <laughs> Man, you're hard. Will you take Frisco? Will you take Frisco today? They start at 93. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah, sure. I'll, sure, sign me up. I often ask, especially guys in the, in the age group that you're in, and please, when I say guys, I'm not singling out male versus female. You get that? It's just the way I talk. Um, oftentimes, especially the 16, 17-year-old, they really don't even know what a decent living wage is. They don't, they don't know what it takes to live like they anticipate that they're going to live when they get a job. But 93 is not bad starting. Uh, not at all, okay? I wish I made 93 after 21 years here, okay? But I can't. I've tried. I just can't. Even if I stay here all around the clock, they just will not pay me that much money. You sign on with Frisco Fire Department. You sign the employment papers. You meet the medical director. You go through your probationary period. You're there. You're you, you work, you're, you're drawing a paycheck. You have signed a contractual obligation with that department. There is another term alert, Jordan, sole provider, S-O-L-E. Not your soul, but the soul as in singularity. Sole provider. Frisco Fire Department is the sole provider for EMS services for the citizens of the city of Frisco. You with me? In other words, if, if a citizen of Frisco or somebody in Frisco calls 911, who is contracted through the county, city, state, which entity must respond to that call? Frisco Fire. Therefore, they are the sole provider. Now, if I had a XYZ transfer service in Frisco, and there may be one, I don't know, but if I had a private EMS service in Frisco who was just managing non-emergency calls, and you call their number directly and say, hey, XYZ ambulance, I'm having chest pain, come get me. They probably won't. They'll probably refer you to the city of Frisco or Frisco Fire. Why don't they have to? Not the sole provider. They're not the sole provider. They don't have a contract to be the sole provider for that city. So what about the duty to act? Therefore, they have no duty to act. Now, they have a moral obligation to make sure the call gets met, right? And they may have a mutual aid, new term agreement, I mean new term, mutual aid agreement, with Frisco Fire that says, hey, if we can't respond because we're so busy, you can now or you should now. That's a mutual aid agreement, but that's not a sole provider. So back to you, you're working for Frisco Fire. You clock in that morning, your own shift. You have now established yourself of having a duty to act with the sole provider who has a duty to act if they get called. The contract's just rolling downhill. If you say, uh, I'm not answering this call at seven in the morning because we haven't had breakfast yet and I just pulled it off the stove. The eggs are scrambled and we're ready to eat. They can wait. Have you breached the duty to act? Yeah, and you're gonna get fired. You just lost 93,000 a year, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're probably going to get fired. You get off shift. You live in Oklahoma because it's cheaper to live up there, and that 93000 will go a lot further in Atoka, Oklahoma, than it will in Frisco, Texas. Okay? And a lot of people do that for that reason. I'll go down here and make the money, and I'll live up here where it's cheaper. I only have to drive once every three days. Now it's what, once every four days with the 48, 96 hour shifts. We'll talk about those tomorrow as they apply to your health. You're driving home from Frisco, uh, headed up to Atoka. You know where Atoka's at in Oklahoma? Uh, yes. And so you cross the river bridge and exit one, my exit, uh, I've rolled off the edge of the pavement and overturned my truck. Do you have to stop? What I thought I knew versus now what I know. You do not have to stop. 
How come? He has no duty to act. He's not under any contractual thing anymore, is he? Huh? Wait a minute. So Fifi's got a... I saw you go, oh, what? You did that little number on me. What, what? You saw something happen, car accident, somebody rolled. You were obligated to stop as a citizen. Really? Really. Good. Yeah, Good. I would hope you would stop. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not. I am not stopping my vehicle on Highway 75 to render aid. I will get killed. We have firefighters and paramedics out there who are getting hurt across this nation every day with $150,000 Quint fire trucks, a quarter million dollar Quint fire trucks blocking traffic and people still seem to weave in and out of that. I have no safety vest on, I have no barriers, I have no lighting, I have no protection, and I have no duty to act. I will use my ethical judgment and my moral judgment to make the determination whether I'll stop. I was, I was leaving the college and I drive 75 to go home every day. And the exit at Walmart in Denison, everybody can kind of familiar with what I'm talking about? The Walmart exit in Denison, uh, the Morton Street exit. I often take that, I take it every day, basically, unless I'm coming the back way. Well, I was, I was going north on 75. You can see the brake lights start hitting traffic, starting to do things, but I'm close enough that I approach an accident scene and I see an overturned car between the off-ramp and Highway 75 proper. They're, they're up in that ditch area. And I'm still kind of slowing down, trying to figure out, you know, do I stop, do I, do I go on? Having that moral dilemma. I'm close enough, I'm like, and this just happened. There's probably some, if life-saving interventions are gonna be done, the quicker the better. And I'm like, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and stop. So I'm slowing down, kind of getting off on the shoulder. I mean, you do that and here comes somebody in a Camaro, you know, just never checks up. And you're like, oh, I don't want to step out of this car. I haven't gotten out of the truck yet when, pe when other people were running toward the car. And they would run up to the car and they went like this. And the next one run up to the car and they go, oh, I just kept going. At that point, I kept going. Why? What was I reading from the scene? What was my scene size up? Something was bad in that car, wasn't it? When bystanders will turn and run from it, not even gawk, there was something bad in that car. Be careful trying to read damage to the car to indicate severity of the accident. Uh, because cars are designed to be damaged. That, that takes energy away from the occupant. The car was torn up, but that wasn't my clue. My clue was the occupants or the bystanders were not approaching it. I went on. And, it, and the traffic just got worse. It just got worse. I didn't have a duty to act. I would put myself in jeopardy if I was to act because I'd be standing in an unsafe scene. And I answered my moral question. And that is a hard question here, people. I'm gonna throw a rule out. If you can't live by this rule, then go withdraw. I mean, I, I, it's as blunt as that can be. I'm not trying to be an ass. I'm not trying to be harsh. But if you can't live by this, if you can't do this rule, then you need to leave. Rule number one, people die. It's a fact, it's terminal, we're all living in disease called life, and we're all going to get out of it the same way. We'll talk tomorrow about how to make that better, but there's still a cliff we're going to fall off of. Can't change it. That's the rule. People die, rule number two, can't change rule number one. Those, that's about the only absolute thing in life, is that it will end. And you're going to find patience in their final years, who have went through suffering and all this other stuff, who will actually tell you, you know what the best part about living is? You get to die. That means they're done. 
that person was dead. That person was, uh, may I just say, had an injury non-compatible with life. That's a term you need to use. They had an injury non-compatible with life. Questions, comments, concerns? What's the third part of it? Third part of what? The quote that said, the people die. Oh, two rules. Rule number one, people die. Rule number two, you can't change rule number one. If you can, if you can handle that, you're in the right place. So our entire job and focus of this course and paramedic course and physicians and trauma centers and hospitals is to try to interrupt that if needed. Interrupt that. You're headed forward a cliff really fast and I'm gonna reel you back from that cliff. That's kind of how it works. And I'm gonna teach you, we're gonna teach you the skills in, in order to do that with someone. Duty to act exists while you're on duty with your service. Duty to act does not exist when you're not on duty in most states. Texas, you have no duty to act if you're off. There probably are some states in this country, and I, can, I could name one, but I will not, who probably says if we give you a license, you will stop and help, whether you're on duty or not. It's just a parameter of us granting you a license, okay? Uh, I don't think we're anywhere close to that state, whether we're Texas or Oklahoma. This is why you will not find any emblems or anything on any of my vehicles that says, I'm a paramedic. I'm with the fire department. Do you know why I don't have any of those emblems? It's not that I'm not proud of the business. Some people are going to think we're... Yeah, what's, what's John Q. Public going to think when the paramedic drives by the accident scene? I'm going to call that fire department and your guy drove by here and he didn't even stop and help and my mother was in there bleeding to death and she died and it's your fault because he could have stopped and helped her. At, I, I, you don't want to explain that out. Do you? You don't want to explain that out. I get it. I get it. It's all, it, you know, we got 100 EMS students running through this year. We got the t-shirts. You're just pretty much throwing up a flag that I know what to do in case of an emergency. I have enough people yelling my name without identification. I'll be at a basketball game in our local high school. Somebody falls, gets hurt. Is Brandon in here? I just wanna eat my popcorn, man. <laughs> just leave me alone. Yeah, he's here. And a lot of times they don't like what I have to say because my, 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 my severity of injuries is a little bit relative, right? If you rolled your ankle on a basketball court, I'm probably not going to get near as excited as the mom. I have to play like I am. If I'm on the ambulance, I have to play like I am. But I'm like, it'll be all right. You can go. You're, you're fine. You're fine. Other criteria apply. And I need to preface a little bit thing here. Don't ever do anything that uh, violates what your protocol says or your contractual obligation with the department, okay? Those, those things supersede anything I'm telling you in here. And I hope you make sense of that. But no, uh, Jordan, back to your question. You don't have to stop. Do I have a moral obligation to stop? I don't know what your morals are. My, moral, my morals and your morals are probably not the same. They're similar. I can tell you they're similar, but they're not the same. My morals have adjusted as I've gained experience. It's probably experience because you're not adjusted. It does, it, yeah, it factors into the next decision making process. It certainly does. But I gotta stay within the legal boundaries. I gotta know what I can get away with. I gotta know what, I, what looks good, what doesn't look good in the public eye. Do not. 
if I could give you one piece of advice right now, that'd probably be the most beneficial I could give you today. Do not put anything on social media that indicates you're in this business. And boy, people are proud of it. You ought to be proud to go to school and you ought to be proud of the certifications you earn. You ought to be proud of the career choice to walk into a place of chaos and hostility and make sense of it. You ought to be proud of that. Share that face to face, don't share it to the world. You're just putting yourself out there against a standard that may not even exist or may be an unrealistic standard, right? I doubt John Q. Public reads the National EMS standards. I doubt John Q. Public understands duty to act. And Jordan, forgive me here, they didn't, did they? Jordan comes into this class as John Q. Citizen. It's Jordan. Jordan's going to leave as an EMT. She now knows. Right? And, and there are others in this. I mean, I'm picking on you because you're vocal about it, and I love that. Good Samaritan laws. And I'm sure somebody says, well, what about the Good Samaritans? Good Samaritan took its turn from the Bible with the Samaritans and stuff. Um, Good Samaritan laws do exist in certain localities, and you must understand your local state ordinances against with those. If I was to stop at that scene and I was to render aid, do I have all the equipment I would have if I was on an ambulance? No. Would I work to the best of my ability under the circumstances in which I was there? Yes. Could anyone get on to me because I didn't have a heart monitor or an IV set up? No, I was just acting as what? A good Samaritan under the best ability with any person who was reasonable and prudent would do with the same thing. I have to take that into account if I was to stop. Um, do you think because I hold certification and licensure that my standard of reasonable and prudent would change? Would, would the public expect me to be able to, to better perform this than... They, they kind of would, wouldn't they? They kind of hold me to a better standard, but don't hold me to a standard I can't perform because I don't have all the equipment with me. You'll find out you can do a lot of good with very little equipment as we go through this. There's a lot of stuff in the ambulance that at the end of the day doesn't really make much difference. You see a word popping up. This word is called negligence. That's going to be that one that's going to get you. If anything's going to bite you in legalities, it's going to be the word negligence, and we're about to get into that, okay? I just said this. Good Samaritan, do the best you can. Act professionally. The courts will realize you're only doing what you can do. So don't, don't get hung up on that. I would say this if I were you. Once you become a professional, the Good Samaritan thing goes way down your priority list because you're going to be held to a different standard than the public. This just keeps, um, this just keep, they're really designed to keep John Q. Citizen from walking up to an accident scene and pulling somebody out of a car indiscriminately and, you know, their, their ankle, their foot that was partially torn. Now that they jerked them out of the car, it's completely torn. <laughs> All right, you're like, I had my foot till you jerked me out of the car. Um, yeah, but I thought that's what I should do because I thought the car would explode. That, that's what Good Samaritan laws were designed to do. In other words, if you're a professional, don't depend on those because you should know better. It's a different standard, so please understand that. Other legal protections, not that you have a lot. Sovereign immunity, um, you know you can't sue the government. You ever heard of the Emergency Declaration Act? If you lived through COVID, you did. How are we going to use a medicine or a vaccine or a test that hasn't went through clinical trials? Emergency authorization use, and you can't sue us if something goes wrong. If you took COVID vaccine, and we're not getting into that debate, but if you took the COVID vaccine, you signed away your right to sue because the government said it would be okay. Emergency authorization use. If you got a COVID test at home and got in the mail for free, it wasn't free, but somebody paid for it. Look on the back of it. It'll say, under use by emergency declaration. Government can't be sued. So there, you might get into some of that. 
I mean, there's a reason the government can't be sued because they have unlimited funds and they're a big target. So sometimes you can't sue the government or the agency. Uh, whether you fall into that would be circumstantial. Statutes of limitations, can't come back 15 years ago. Hey, remember 15 years ago when you didn't splint my arm correctly? It's kind of been messed up ever since and it's hurting now and I think I'm gonna go back and sue you because I got arthritis in it. Uh, sorry, dude. Uh, contributory negligence on part of the patient. That's what the patient does to themselves. You contributed to this. And we'll talk tomorrow about how most patients contribute to their own demise. I'll preface that by saying about 90 something percent of all medical issues are lifestyle choices. So we'll get into that tomorrow. So you might fall into this and be protected. You hope your lawyer, if you are getting uh, sued or brought to court, you hope your lawyer can find something as easy as this because then the DA or the prosecutor or the judge or something would kick it out and go, yeah, that's, that's not gonna work. We talked about medical direction. You cannot function as an EMT until you are working under that um, DO or MD. You have to follow the protocol. Standing orders is, uh, how many of you ever been to the hospital or doctor's clinic? Most of us, if not all of us. Physician comes in and he gives you a physical exam, determines what's wrong, writes a prescription, and says also do this, give them a shot of penicillin. Nurse picks those orders up, goes and draws up the penicillin, gives the shot, gives discharge instructions, and go home. Those are orders right then and there. Standing orders are like in advance. Let me tell you what to do if you ever come across this. And that's basically the protocols. So when you see standing orders and protocols, they're basically the same thing. It's the doctor writing the prescription in advance, basically. With me on that? Gus, you with me on that? The doctor says, if you run across this, this is what I want you to do for it. That's a standing order. That's a little bit different than orders written in a hospital. Turn the patient every four hours, give them um, this antibiotic three times a day, all that stuff. Can you call medical direction? What I know versus what I don't know. I can see this in being a sticky point. So give me your name. <clears throat> Aiden. 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 I'll try to remember that, Aiden. Don't hold me to it if I forget, though, okay? Don't, don't beat me up. Aiden. Um, if I call medical direction, do I have to call my medical director? No. Usually I can call the receiving hospital and ask to speak to the ER physician on duty. Because that's the ER physician that's going to continue the care of the patient I'm bringing them. Can I call my medical director to get advice and direction? Sure. Yes. It, it, that can get sticky sometimes. You, you'll, you'll bring a patient in to the hospital sometimes and the, and the doctor on duty will say, why'd you do this? And you say, well, my medical director told me to, or that's in our protocol. Take it up with them. You gotta be tactful, can't be a smart aleck but it happens. As long as you act in the best interest of the patient, you acted within the protocols or the standing orders established by your medical director, things should be cool. But uh, if that medical director is in Houston and he's got 50 EMS agencies, you may or may not get a hold of that person. So you're probably gonna call down at TMC and say, or wherever, I need to speak to a physician when I'm bringing in this, I need advice. So the answer is, yes, you can call medical direction, but you don't have to call them on every call. It's only when you get to thinking, this isn't fitting a protocol nicely, or I've got some confusion. Or you're asking permission to perform something because you really think this is important right now. Some protocols, guys, some protocols are written, and I'm just gonna be numerical here in stepwise fashion. If you see something, do this first, then do this, if needed, then do this, if needed, kind of like a flow chart. And sometimes we call this line between say four and five or whatever, 
We call that med direction line. It means you can do this, but you're going to talk to me before you do step five. You with me? So if you hear the term med direction line or med line, it means you can do all this without talking to me. Use your best clinical judgment. You get down in this little exotic area, you better call me first. And I'm going to tell you what the answer will be nine times out of ten. That's going to be the answer in the majority. Every time I've ever called to ask for something, they said no. Anybody want to speculate on why I get rejected? Please tell me why I get rejected. Could be. They gave you permission and it puts them at risk. I'm sorry? They gave you permission and it puts them at risk. Yeah, they, they know it's going to be on them if something goes bad. Could be, it could be kind of like pushing the scope and nobody wants to answer for that. It's easier than what you're coming up with, though. What do what you want to say, Gus? Not you got something on your brain? It's expensive. Could be expensive. Risk benefit analysis. It's easier than this. A little more dangerous to do certain things. That's true. And that's why we got that line. It can only be done in a hospital. Maybe. Maybe best performed. I think anything we do out here is better performed in a hospital. So. You're making it hard, y'all. Yes. They just don't want to. Well, that's too easy. <laughs> They're not lazy. <laughs> they just don't want to. <laughs> ah, don't do that. It's too much paperwork. It's kind of like getting pulled over for DUI. You've been drinking? A little bit. How close are you to the house? <laughs> right there. Get out of here. I don't want to do the paperwork. They don't think you can do it right? They don't. Well, you're, you're, you're stepping in the bucket now. Let's back up and do a little mental gymnastics here. If I call, ask permission, what have I really said? I've questioned my judgment. If I have to call and get, if I have to call and explain something, there's doubt in my mind, isn't there? So every time I've went in there, I've asked to do something in the field. The doctor said, nah, just come on in. You're not that far away. It's better performed here. Blah, blah, blah. I get in there. Doctor immediately does what I asked to do. I'm like, wouldn't it have benefit the patient if I'd done that 10 minutes ago? He goes, I wasn't looking at the patient 10 minutes ago. I am now. You were right. You just had doubt. If you got doubt, I'm going to say no. Because you are the eyes and ears, nose, touch, smell, all that. You are my senses. Is there anything you would need permission for? Depends on them. Depends on them. Call and say, hey, I'm going to do this. If, you say yes. If you violate the protocol, but yet that thing you're asking to violate is still within the scope, the scope doesn't get technical. Scope one of those slightly flexible things? Yeah, the scope just, the scope just says, let's get exotic. There, there is a... a, a a, a procedure called a finger thoracotomy where you cut a hole in the chest between the ribs and you stick your finger in there and you pop the balloon to let the trapped air out. We'll talk about that in trauma. Paramedic, that's in the national scope of practice that paramedics can do that. I don't know of any medical director that allows that. But if I see this big, I'm going to use words you haven't heard yet, tension pneumothorax and I'm like, this guy is going down the hill. I'm going to get on the phone with med director and I'm like, this is not in the protocol. But this is what I got. Most agencies don't allow shut schools? Most do not allow that. And the reason why is they can't train the paramedics effectively to do it. How are you going to train paramedics to do that? You just kind of have to hang out in the ER until you get one. They thought about doing it with pigs. That doesn't look good. That doesn't look good. Doing an animal test for training is touchy. Right? Did I answer your question though? I mean, one question is more like in the protocol it says you get to step five, you must call, right? Mm -hmm. I know what the patient needs. My protocol says that I have to call. Instead of saying, can I do this? 
this yeah, if, if it's if it's already written down, they just want to know that you're doing it so they can help guide you through it. What we're talking about, calling for permissions, is something that doesn't exist in the protocol or an adjustment to the protocol. And in that case, I need to get permissions. Yeah, the, the line like I drew on the board just means, hey, I'm about to go here. Okay, let me walk you through it or let's, let's stay in contact, tell me how it goes, be aware of, something like that, just so I know, just so they know. But if I'm wanting to, to change a protocol or violate a rule, or, um, I, I mean, here's one, asthma, asthma's bad. Usually it's broken with the medications that the patient has with them. If not, they call EMS, we administer medications. If it's still not broken, we administer more medications. And those are nationally recognized, commonly used medications for asthma. But I could, I, I could use morphine for asthma. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what? Yeah, I can nebulize morphine and it's a smooth muscle relaxant. It could open up the bronchial tree as well because nothing else has worked. That would be where I get on the phone. Hey doc, I know morphine is a uh, smooth muscle relaxant and nothing else has worked and this patient is still suffering from asthma. How about me nebulizing some morphine like that? I don't have a protocol for that and you're not using a narcotic for that issue. You're like, okay, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's not in the protocol. I'm not getting orders for doing it, but it, it could have helped the patient. But you walk in there and the doc says, go ahead and nebulize some uh, morphine. That was a pretty good idea, thank you. And they may be protecting you in that regard too. So what happens if you do go past that line? If you do it, then you're committing an act of commission. But what if it's the best interest of the patient? Hope nothing goes wrong. Hope nothing goes wrong. If it goes wrong, you're, you're, you're wanting to do negligence, aren't you? We're gonna talk about negligence soon. If, if it goes wrong, you, can I scare you a little bit? There are some things that we're doing in the profession, in healthcare, not just paramedic, but all across the board. We're doing some things in this profession that are wrong, that never get tested, that never get questioned. And that's sad. Um, I, guess I, I guess this is okay to speak on, on a recording. I was on a campus carry committee here one time, uh, several, several years ago, the governor, governor and the legislature signed in a law that you could conceal carry on campus as long as you had a concealed carry permit. And um, boy, that set off a firestorm, right? And everyone was like, what are we gonna do? There are gonna be all these guns on campus now and all that stuff. And um, So I was on the research portion of the committee where it says, go out there and just see how, how many people get killed with guns because of campus carry. Well. It, it's only the cops that negligently just charge, but that's a different story. That's not where I'm going to go with this. It's not where I'm wanting to go with this. So I was just running some numbers, like how many people are getting shot because people are now carrying concealed weapons on campus. Take out the mass shooter people, the people who intend to do harm, it doesn't exist. doesn't exist so being who I am I'm gonna like let's just compare this to other things in society about 3,000 people a month die from medical error in the nation okay <laughs> it's it's safer to be about a bunch of guns than it is to go to the hospital obviously Statistics don't lie, but liars use statistics, right? It's not safe to be in the medical practice. We're human, errors are made, and we have deadly things and deadly procedures. They're on that protocol. EMTs, I call it a bag of tools. You got a bag of tools. You got, you got a hammer and a tape measure. The paramedic has got a table saw, radial arm saw, a router, a joiner, a laser pointer, a laser level. 
excavate, you know, the, got a big bag of tools here that can do some serious damage. To put that in perspective, we don't learn a lot of skills in EMT school relative to what the paramedics do, but ours are the most important. But ours in this class are the most important. And paramedics get into trouble when they go to line five, four and five and not do one and two. One and two is probably something you're gonna learn in this school or in this class. Three, four, five is something more advanced. Some even, even write it like this. This is the EMT line. This is the advanced EMT line. And this is the paramedic line. And then down here would be med, med control. Some, some write it like that as well. That way the EMT knows what the EMT is supposed to do. The paramedic knows what he or she is supposed to do when they look at the book. Cool? To answer every question that's out there at the moment? Okay. Ethics and morals. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in this. There is an EMT code of ethics. You know, physicians, they have to read the Hippocratic Oath. You know, there is a code of ethics that's published. You can probably find that online or in your textbook. It's a code of ethics. Ethics are established by the profession. Morals, you ready for one? What I think I know versus what I now know. If you are in this denomination, this is no slam on you whatsoever. I have utmost respect for it. But someone who is a Jehovah's Witness will not take blood. Unless it's their own blood. They won't do a blood transfusion. They won't allow you to do a blood transfusion on their kids. That's against my morals in effect. If my child can survive by getting blood, they're going to get blood. The Jehovah, sure, I, I understand. That's my belief. So morals are a little bit more personal, where ethics are kind of industry-wide. That probably sparked a question. In my experience, that usually creates a question. Anybody have that? It may be with uh, people of Islamic faith, and nobody looks at the female other than the husband. Could you still give that, like, in that situation? Could you give that child blood? Not if the parent says no. Not if the parent says no. Yes? What happens if they're, like, unconscious and you give, like, a Jehovah's Witness or something blood? You acted in the best interest of the patient and you didn't know. But if it is clearly, without a doubt, stated, maybe they told you before they went unconscious. I'm gonna call for help. <laughs> I'm gonna let someone else know the dilemma I'm in and see if they got any advice for me. But remember, medical directors aren't lawyers. I, I actually know a medical director who is a lawyer. But you gotta be careful. Just think about what the courts are going to look at you. It, did you act as a reasonable and prudent person? Did you act in the best interest of the patient? I don't think anybody's going to put you in the slammer over that, but I don't want to be on Fox News tonight. I don't want an example made of me because I was just trying to do the right thing. But knowingly violating, that's called autonomy. Patients have, new word alert, Jordan, autonomy. A U T O. N-O-M-Y, I think I'm spelling that correctly in my head. Autonomy. That's the ability to make your own decisions. That's the COVID fuss, people. That's the COVID fuss. You can't do this or that unless you've taken the vaccine. You're erasing my autonomy. That was the COVID fuss. It's kind of funny. Uh, we have to give our kids vaccines to put them in school. And we don't question that one, but whatever. I'm not going down that road. I don't want anybody telling me what I can do to myself or my children. Do you? You want autonomy. Can autonomy be lost? Oh yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That's why you write things in advance before you ever get in a position where you lose your autonomy. And if you clearly violate those advanced directives, that's the next new word, then you're in trouble. 
that answer the question? Maybe. You got a question, Gus. Uh, so like even if it's a, uh, so let's say you got a Jehovah Witness parent, and the child's gonna die, like if they don't get the blood. Because the child's a minor, but. Uh, yeah. So who. The autonomy lies within the parent. Even if the child says, give, give it to me. <laughs> the autonomy lies within the parent. Unless the child is emancipated. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in a little bit. If that child is pregnant, the parent doesn't have autonomy anymore. If that child is in the military, if that child is um, deemed by the courts to be emancipated, meaning they take care, they pay their own bills, they, they do their own job, they don't live at home, they're not on the mom and dad's tax forms, make the decision. There's ways a minor can gain autonomy, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But to answer your question straight up, unless they're emancipated, parents rule. Not stepdad who doesn't have custody. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> does the school have permissions if they're in school? Maybe. Depends on if they have that paper on the file that gives them the right to make those decisions. There's a Latin term. You're not going to see this in the PowerPoint, so I'll write it on the board. And it's probably going to come up in uh, your something. In loco parentis. It's Latin for in place of the parent. So it's just a good place to throw that down, Gus. If there, if there is someone who is acting in place of the parent, and most school districts are in loco parentis. Uh, when you enroll your child in school, you probably sign the papers that says, or you can elect not to sign them, says you're not doing anything for this child without me being notified first. Most people don't play that. They're gonna say, if I trust you to teach my kid and keep them for eight hours a day, I also trust you to summon medical help. But what's that mean for us as an EMT or paramedic? I arrive on scene at the school. You probably need to ask the question to the, the teacher, the principal, or somebody at the school while you're there addressing little Johnny who fell off the seesaw and broke his wrist. Have the parents been notified, and uh, do you have the proper paperwork in place for us to do this? If it's life-threatening, you don't need any of that. We'll, we'll get there. I mean, this is, this is not easy, is it? And I know you have lots of questions, so please keep asking them, Gus and Luke and Jordan and everybody else in here. Please ask the questions. What's my fail-safe? Best interest of the patient. Reasonable and prudent. What would you want me to do to your kid? What would I want done to my kid? Those, we call those tests. Uh, universality test, I think is the name of it. So we talk about the code of eth ethics. Uh, I need you to pay attention to these few things right here. Maintain skill mastery. If, if, if there's a skill that I teach you, but yet after class and upon employment, you haven't done it in a year, don't you think you might ought to redo that skill, kind of practice up on it? You know, I haven't, I haven't done CPR in a long time. I haven't, uh, I haven't intubated a patient, which means putting an airway down into their trachea, down in their throat to breathe for them. That's an advanced skill for a paramedic. If I haven't done one of those in two years, I probably need to get. And some services are real good about monitoring these skills and say, hey, you need to go get on the ambulance make a few calls. If not, we'll put you in the hospital just to maintain skill proficiency. Could that be used against you in courts? Yeah. When's the last time you intubated? Uh, during my clinical rotations uh, back in paramedic school five years ago, and I haven't done one since. Just the luck of the draw. Huh. So that's why you messed up when you done it. Those of you who play sports, those of you who play instruments, got dusted off a little bit every now and then, right? Pull the guitar out. I haven't, I haven't touched this in 10 years. It's going to be a little rusty. 
Fingers aren't going to be calloused. All that stuff, right? Please, please pay attention to that. Remain abreast of changes in EMS. That's as much for me as it is for you. I have to teach you the latest thing. The registry test changes when there are changes in the business. We talked about the backboard issue the other day. Guys, I'm telling you right now, if you're, if you're still putting people on backboards, you need to work somewhere else because that's not evidence-based practice. They have not stayed abreast of changes. It always changes. And sometimes it comes back full circle. I'm hearing stuff now. I'm like, we tried that before, guys. It didn't work then. I, yeah, but it's different now. Okay. You, you just sold the young people the latest, greatest thing. It's all about the money. All right? It just rolls over. Critically review performances. Hey, we had a bad call. What went wrong? What went right? If you're not doing that, you're doing your service, yourself, and your patients. Bad. Report with honesty. When we look at medical errors across the field of medicine, when we look at those errors, those are the ones we know about. How many things do you think medical practitioners do and go, oops, and never say a word about it? A lot. A lot. Is it your... Uh, ethical duty to report when you see an unsafe act occurring or about to occur. And I like to teach by story, not to say, I've, I don't do the war story game. I just like to teach by example, real life things that happen. Paramedic student, my student. We have to do dosage calculations. We have to learn how to do the math. We have to learn how to calculate the dosage. You have to make 100 on that test. You get three attempts, no calculator, all handwritten math. Read a word problem, get the right answer. Can't miss a one. And you got three chances. You could do great in the entire paramedic program, but if you miss one question on that test on exam number three, you walk out the door empty handed. Sorry to put the pressure on you. Sorry to put the pressure on you. Other disciplines can allow like 80s on that test, but we, we have a, we, we say you have to make 100. If you make an 80, you kill two out of 10 people is the way I look at that. Because if you missed the dosage calculation on two people, those are two people who could have died due to med error. And when you're talking thousandths of a gram or 10 thousandths of a gram, when you can get off a thousand fold in your calculations just by a decimal point mess up, you could kill your patients very easily. Got to make 100. So we instill that in your training. We were in the clinical environment one night. The nurse went to, we call hang, which means we hung, put an IV on a pole. There was medicine in that fluid, and that medicine was going in the patient's arm. Everybody with me? Everybody kind of familiar with what the IV thing looks like? The, the paramedic student who was there to learn and observe said, what a great opportunity for me to practice my math. Got out a piece of paper and calculated the dosage himself. And he got his answer and he looked at what the nurse was doing and he's like, damn, I messed up. So he goes and sits down, he does it again. He goes, where am I messing up? So he goes to the preceptor in the hospital, which is a faculty member of Grayson that we assigned to help out, just to make sure students don't screw up. He says, Mr. Preceptor, can you help me with this math? I'm, I keep getting the wrong answer. And the preceptor says, man, you're challenging me. I haven't done math in forever, but let's see. And he's like, I don't know what you're doing wrong, because that's the same answer I'm coming up with. I don't know what we're doing wrong. Well, let's go ask the nurse. So they go over to the nurse and say, hey, can you help us when you get time? Because I can't figure the math out. She's like, sure. So she comes over there, and after she gets everything settled in the room, she comes over, she says, oh, what are you doing? And he's sitting there, he's like, and she goes, shit. That's her exact words. She runs into the room, and she shuts down the IV pump, and she says, get the doctor in here. Doctor comes in here. She explains to the doctor, I'm overdosing this patient. I'm reporting it. I need the doctor in here to see what the consequences might be. The doctor looks at everything and says, well, this is all you got in them at this time. 
We're still in the safe range. Glad you caught it. It's going to be okay. She said, I didn't catch it. If it hadn't been for that student, there's no telling what would have happened. I had no intentions of coming back in and checking. I thought I was right. She walks out of the room. She goes and gets the student. She said, you and I need to go type a little talk. And he's like, oh, crap. She said, let's go to the break room. She said, you probably ought to bring your preceptor with you. And he is about to crap his pants. Because he's thought he's gotten somebody in trouble. I'm about to get kicked out, right? I mean, you're just vulnerable. You're just, they just eat you. We eat our young in this business. And we're like, get in here. She was mad. Get in here. So they went in the little room. And she got in his face and she pointed at him. She said, don't you ever delay questioning me. Why didn't you tell me then that we weren't jiving? Do you get her point? She was witnessed by somebody else. She should have been questioned. He did, was he wrong? His math wasn't wrong, but was he wrong? Yeah, he didn't go in there and like, tactfully, you and I, we're not getting the same number. I know you're experienced, but they just drilled this into my head, and I've done it three times, and I just, tell me. And with her professional ethics, she should have said, yeah, let's look at this. Let's, let's stop this till we agree. I've had those arguments with nurses. I've, I've brought in medications from the field. You've transferred care to the next facility. You tell them what you're doing. I've had nurses tell me, you're not right on your math. And I'm like, I concurred with my partner. We think we're right. No, let me rephrase that. We're right. <laughs> Pretty heated arguments sometimes. Doctor comes in. What's going on here? She said, hey, his math wrong. He's like, well, don't ask me. I don't know how to do it. But don't be so confident or so cocky that you don't go. Let me try it one more time. I immediately knew what her interpretation was. She had it mixed. They have it mixed one way in the hospital. In our protocol, we had it mixed a different way. And I'm like, your error is you're not looking at my chart. You're looking at your chart. It's mixed different. I know that gets technical and detailed, but the point is, if you know where the error is at, have a reasonable consideration. There are just some people you're not going to talk to. By God, if I'm right, I'm right. You've got to drop that arrogance. There's some off-camera things I can tell you later, okay? You'll, you'll find out. Critically reviewed does not mean be a jerk. Right, Luke? Report with honesty. Work harmonious, harmoniously. I think I just got into that by telling you that. We're about to take a break, so hang with me just a little bit. Um, this is probably one of those columns where I thought I knew versus what I now know. So here we go again. I anticipate questions here. You know you can live on campus? Nobody lives on campus. Anybody read bulletin boards on campus? I, I don't know why we have them either. Anybody ever stop and just go in there at the bulletin board and go, what's up here? Did, did you? Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. What's it say on there? The, uh, it's awkward, isn't it? I thought it was the most awkward title you could have. And I don't care who hears that. I'll say it to them. The title of the presentation was, Want to Make Out? I just found it awkward. Maybe I'm wrong. And I'll admit if I am. I right yeah, it is. Want to make out? Are you going to the want to make out? It just, it, eh. the point was you got to have consent. All right. If you want to make out, you need to ask and get consent. It's that whole no means no thing, right? That's in dating. That's in being intimate with someone. That's with, you know, touching someone or something like that. And you'll, you'll see me do it right here. You know, I'll walk up to you because I want to feel of a pulse. And I'll say, can I touch you? Now, that seems a little awkward, too. But guess what? You know what's more awkward? Me reaching down here and grabbing her arm without her permission to check her pulse. You with me? That's called battery. 
touching her without her permission is called battery. The point of that is we have to gain consent to do anything to our patients. Very important milestone in your patient care. Very important milestone in your patient care. You have to have consent to proceed. Now you may have gotten the call, dispatched, drive fast, get on scene, there's my patient. Yeah, they're bleeding. They're also looking at me and talking to me. Can I just drop down and tie a tourniquet on her leg? No. What do I have to do? Ask if they want to be treated. Yeah. 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 I am Brandon. I'm with the EMS agency. I am here to help you. Is that okay? Can I go to work now? If she says yes. I am about to tie a tourniquet on your leg. Or I am about to start an IV in your arm. Is that okay? What must she say before I can do it? Yes. I need to raise your shirt so I can apply a heart monitor to your chest. Is that okay? She has to say yes again. I'm going to give you this medication. And there's a whole bunch of other things I would ask as well. Is that okay? She has to say yes. If any of those interventions I'm about to do, she says, no, I don't want any medicine. But you really need it. Understood, but I don't want it. You go through a whole line of discussion here. But does she, the point is, does she have the right to refuse the medicine? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have to give you consent to be there, they have to con give you consent to work on them, and they really need to give you consent to do all the procedures. Now, we're real bad about doing that. I don't know many paramedics who are walking through the door of a home going, I'm here, can I help you? Pretty much they're assuming, if you call me, you want me to help. That's okay until you get caught. That's okay until something is questioned. That's okay until you bust in my backyard and it's a beautiful Saturday afternoon and, then, and I live in a rural area and I want to get sun all over my body and we'll talk about why I would want to do that tomorrow. And I'm laying in the backyard on my blanket and there's no neighbors and I'm not appearing in the public and I'm nude in the backyard. And, and crazy Martha sees a figure in the backyard and calls 911 and says, hey, there's a man down in, this, in the backyard, he looks dead. We get those calls all the time, right? Woo, 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 woo. Come to my house. I'm like, what the hell are the sirens doing? Yeah, I better get my short on, you know. Sir, we got a call here. Somebody was in the backyard down. I, yeah, I was laying in the sun like a snake. Do you mind if we work on you? Hell yes, I mind. Go. Get out of my yard. I need to get back to it. But sir, can we look in your backyard? No. Do you have a warrant? look in my backyard it was me in the backyard I'm, but sir we got a call that someone was dead in the backyard you sure it wasn't you sure we shouldn't go look it was me sunbathing no you can't go back there sir can we take your vital signs to make sure you're okay no sir can you sign this document refusing treatment I don't need your treatment get out of here I'm not signing anything sir I really I have to inform you of the consequences of not going to the hospital. You might die. And you might too if you don't leave. So go. You, you see where this gets really sticky? What if I was drunk? What if I'd fallen out of a tree and had a head injury? And I'm saying, no, I don't want you. Go. This is competent patient. It has to be competent patient. Got to be of sound mind and judgment. We're bad in this business. Careful here. We're bad in this business. To, to get us to get consent, you have to be competent. The patient has to be competent. If they're not competent, they can't truly give you consent. How do you judge competency? Their actions. That's the one that gets us in a little bit of an issue right there. I know your name's kind of different. 
Uh, hell, give me credit. I got that much. Mm -hmm. What's your name? Chestina. 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 Do you have a shorter version of that? Chas. Chas? Thank you. Chas. <laughs> um, I have seen reports written like this. That's an and sign. Or sometimes I see them like this. A and O times three, A and O times four. The A and the O stand for alert and oriented times three, alert and oriented times four. Four what? Four questions. What four questions? Yeah, yeah boy, don't ask anybody that question. <laughs> Do you realize the political climate we're in right now? <laughs> you go ask Bubba down here at the gas station who the president is today. I know what answer you'll get. Not my damn president. <laughs> and I don't care who's in there if somebody's going to say that. Not my president. But we use it. You are 100% correct. There are paramedics and EMTs who use that. Can you be drunk and name the president? Can you be drunk and give your name? Can you be drunk and tell somebody where you're at? Sometimes. I always know I'm drunk at home. <laughs> I don't get drunk anywhere else. All right? If you're smart, you won't get drunk. Any if you're smart, you won't get drunk. But if you do get drunk, do it at home. Well, the person, place, time, and event. That's the three. If you're going to go A and O times three, people go, who are you? What time is it? And do you know where you're at? There are mentally incompetent people who can answer those questions. Do not let that be your basis for judging competency. Well, let's add one more question. Let's add the fourth question. Do you know what's going on? Do you know what day of the week it is? Sometimes I have to pause and think. Sometimes we ask them really some ridiculous questions. Can you say your alphabet backwards? That's not a judge of competency, is it? You know what a good test for Alzheimer's disease is? You won't find this in any of the textbooks either, but ask the patient to say the, to spell world backwards, like the whole world. Ask them to spell that backwards. You try it. Did you get it? Did he get it? I couldn't hear him completely. You got it? -R -O it wasn't easy, was it? No. <laughs> and Jordan's like, oh, please don't ask me. I don't know. But it just kind of, I saw the eyes go up. You were visualizing the word. Alzheimer's patient will just sit here and go, something. You know, they don't even have that to do it. Guys, be careful judging competency. There is a sixth sense that we all have. Some are more developed than others. Some people have it much more developed than others. You ever heard the old phrase, trust the gut? Trust the gut? I had a, stu a, a student in this class one time who was a former child protective services worker. He was a field investigator. When there was a call for child abuse or potential child abuse and neglect, he would have to go out to the homes and check it out, right? <coughs> Thank God those people exist. I hate it that they have to exist, but thank goodness they're there. They're one of those resources we could call, and we'll talk about that later. I often ask him, I'm like, you know, if my kid gets mad, and I had a little kids at the time, I said, if my little kid gets mad at me and he calls or somebody says, you know, my dad beats me or something, and you walked up to the house because you got a call to this residence, I'm like, I don't abuse my kids, I don't think. He's like, we know within seconds if this is a case or not. Trained, experienced, sixth sense. Things are cool here. Now that can get you in a bind, right? Because there are people who are pretty slick. But you just know something's not right. And if you ever get that feeling, do a little more investigating. Don't just leave. If you come to my house, I come out of the backyard pulling up some wind trunks and say, hey, everything's cool here, you can go on. Okay, just, just let it go. Um, but if I, you see a chainsaw and I've, I'm cut and I'm staggering in my gait, Maybe we shouldn't try to prove competence. Maybe we should disprove incompetence. Does that make sense to you? 
maybe we should rule out incompetence instead of trying to do competence by three silly little questions. Alzheimer's patients oftentimes can tell you who they are. You don't know what memories they're having at the moment, but obviously they're not competent to make sound medical decisions, are they? The easy one, guys, is if they're unconscious. If they are unconscious upon arrival, you've got consent. That consent is called implied. You're implying that if they were able to talk in their condition that they're in, that they would probably want you to help them. Me asking you if I can put a tourniquet on your leg and control your bleeding and you say yes is called expressed. She's expressing to me. That's the point of the workshop that they had on campus. You expressed to me that you want to have an intimate relationship. You don't just because I'm drunk and I can't answer, right? It doesn't work that way in that, in that environment. You have to get consent. We're, we're kind of lax on this. I've seen a lot of guys stick IVs and do blood pressure on people. And you're like, they jump and they're like, what are you doing? They're like, oh, I have to start. And you're not starting an IV. I don't like needles. You're not doing that to me. We should be really a little more careful with that. This is one of those things that slip from our, we just assume a lot. And you know what they say about assume. Final question, then we'll take our break. At any point during this treatment or transport, the patient says, I'm done with you, I'm out. Can they? Mm -hmm. Now they've given you consent, you've started treatment, you may be even driving down the road with them in the back of the ambulance. They say, that's enough, I'm, with, I'm, I'm, I'm done with you, I'm out of here, stop everything. Can they have the right to withdraw consent? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Patient rules, as long as they're competent. What if you gave them what? What if you gave them that stuff? Still have the right to stop. Still have the right to stop. People use that to their advantage, though, Jordan. Some people like narcotics and uh, uh, Xannies and stuff like that, and they're like, hey, they got uh, benzodiazepine, which is a Xanax, a Valium, an Ativan, or whatever on the ambulance, and if I just act like I need that and they give it to me, and I, once I get it, then I'll withdraw consent. Uh, some people, you will wake up by giving them sugar in the IV, and then they wake up, and they're like, I'm not going to the hospital. And you're like, I already started working on you. I've already given you medication. You were unconscious when I got here. They still have the right to withdraw consent. There's some other pieces to that, and that's called a refusal, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. But yeah, even if you started, you can stop it. Maybe it's different than the yeah. Nope. You can walk out of there AMA. So here's the scenario. Okay, let's hear it. This lady, she's 20 years old, she's having asthma, everything I did wouldn't work, so the doctor insulates her. She's got a propofol. Um, at this point, she's already intubated. She wakes up, bucks the tube, opens her eyes, looks me in the eyes, and mouths the word, please take it out over the tube. She's mouthing it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Will you obviously put her back under? I'll get consent back. Take some more. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. The doctor said, I'm not taking the tube out because she is she's she's not I don't know that she's of sound mind at that moment. And you can make the legal medical argument that when when too much CO two builds up in the blood which is what goes wrong with asthma patients. It's not that they don't get enough oxygen as much as they just don't get rid of enough CO2. We'll get into that next week. And so there's a condition called CO2 narcosis. You, you're acting, some people do this to get high. You ever heard of autoerotic asphyxiation? Where you tie something around your neck to restrict your breathing while you masturbate? This is, this is not an off-camera topic. Because you're going to make calls, usually to young men, who accidentally hang themselves. You'll think it's a suicide. No, it was just they were. If if, if their pants are off, it's it's what we're going to walk into, y'all. You have no idea what you're going to walk into that bedroom. Mom can't mom can't open the door. Firefighters bust the bedroom door in. There's Johnny in the closet. I mean, for real. So, so that CO2 building up in the blood causes you to act drunk. It, that's why they call it narcosis. It's like your own narcotics. Um, some people purposely do breathing 
you heard of huffing or whippets? Whippets more specifically. Take the CO2 cartridge, pop it, hit it, and your head flies back. That's why they call it a whippet, because you whip back. It's that rush of CO2 in the blood that's causing your brain. So the legal argument could be made, she's really not competent to make that decision because not only the CO2 buildup, which may or may not be proven, but she's also suffering from the effects of a sedative, the propofol. Okay, so sedatives change that. Yes, just like alcohol would change it. But not painkillers? Or... Yeah, they could too, depending on the painkiller. Everybody's on them. Everybody's got them. Well, I thought you just said a second ago that, that they could do that, but they didn't do whatever they want. They got after you as long as they're mentally competent. And, and, and part of being incompetent would be under the influence of drugs or medications. So if they're competent and they allow you to do work on them, let's say you give them a small dosage of ketamine and they say, get me off this ambulance. Mm -mm. You can't do that. Mm -mm. You're, not, you're not of sound mind. You're taking a K trip. You think you're going down the big hole. That's why you want out. No. Because at the hospital, like if they were on the UDMA, they're more than welcome to. But if they're on narcotics, they have to find dry. As soon as they leave and if they're dry, we have it's to all on them. The yeah, it's all on them. So. Holding someone against their will is illegal. That's why you have something. They die and if they're not going to sign it, which some will not, mm -hmm. then, you then you just document, 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 document. Yeah. It, I, my general rule in the field was it was much easier for me to convince someone to go to the hospital than it was for me to take the risk of a refusal or an AMA or withdrawing of consent. Now, I have to use judgment there, too. So if that diabetic patient who was unconscious because their blood sugar got too low and I come in, I can't give them sugar by mouth because they're unconscious and we don't put anything in an unconscious person's mouth that we want them to swallow. So I start the IV, I give the sugar through the vein and they wake up and they're great. They're like, don't take me to the hospital. I'm like, I'm not taking you to the hospital. I'm going to make you a meal. You got anything there to make a sandwich out of? Because I want to feed you. Because there's no reason to go to the ER and get a $5,000 lunch when all you need is food in your body and I can do that and I document the hell out of that. Of course I do a complete assessment too, right? Let's keep an eye on your blood sugar, especially if the patient is like, I know where I messed up. I took my insulin before I left work and I didn't I had a flat tire and I didn't get to have my lunch break, you know, whatever the case may be. Think, just think. Is that acting in the patient's best interest what I just described? Yes. Uh, no, it's not the last one. It doesn't have to be. You're on the highway, you're doing like 80, you're running lights and sirens. The paramedic gives them the sugar. They wake up and they're ready to go. Obviously, you don't pull over on the side of the road. You, you, you tell them, this is not the place to pull over. This is not safe. I'm not going to allow you to get out of here on the side of the road while it's not safe. It, can, it could theoretically get to the point, it's like, no, you are stopping right now. It's like, do you understand the risk? Before you have that argument, I think your driver could find a safe place to pull over. Married for 30 years, that's not... This, that's not an issue in my house. If you if for, for to say, I mean, you just know, right? But uh, I, I guess in the dating world, that that's probably a different way of looking at it. When you see something like that on the title, you've all at least been at that point in your life at least once. Yeah. Yeah. Some once, maybe just once. <laughs> you know. Yeah. We'll get into, uh, toward the end of the class, we'll get into like a special populations. And that's where we start talking about abuse and neglect. That is a hard lecture to get through. It's a, it's a, because there's just so many people who have at some point in their life been abused or neglected. And when you look at the definition, that runs from financial to physical and everything in between. And some people are so sheltered that they can't open their mind to realizing that society does such bad things to each other. And that, that really gets, 
it upsets people. Some people just like, I won't hear it. My wife is one of those. She's like, I know what you do or have done, and I won't hear it. No, do not put that in my head. We'll talk about that tomorrow. That's a very bad thing. It's a very bad thing when you can't find the right person to talk to. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to leave this unlocked in case there's one or something that needs to come in, but it looks like everybody's back. So, remind me, you had something to say. Give me your name again, I'm sorry. Jonah. Jonah, give me something. GCS score. GCS score. GCS score 10, but it made no time score. So, what Jonah is referring to is something we'll talk about in uh, the second eight weeks when we get into trauma. GCS is Glasgow Coma Score. You don't have to write that down and memorize it right now. It's just a scoring system to say at what mental capacity, what level of coma. Have you ever heard the word coma before? They're in a coma. How much coma? Um, do y'all know who Lord Kelvin was? No, I think he was. I think he predated that. He was a lord. Not the lord, but a lord. Lord Kelvin. If I'm not mistaken, that's why the Kelvin Fahrenheit or the Kelvin temperature scale got established that they use in science. Zero degrees Kelvin, absolute zero. Lord Kelvin once said, and I'm paraphrasing, to speak not in numbers you speak as a fool, to speak in numbers you speak the truth. Here's an example. I'm rich. Do you believe that? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I'm on a teacher wage. Not on a teacher wage. If I said I had $10,000 in savings, would anybody in here say I was rich? Why? I wish I had 10000 period. Right? It's all relative, isn't it? It's all relative. I don't have 10000 in savings. <laughs> well, I do. I do in a, if you take retirement. Um, but they had to do it for me because I wasn't disciplined enough to do it myself, right? Uh, is Bill Gates rich? He's not Elon Musk rich. Elon Musk would burn Bill Gates' money and stay warm just for fun. Elon probably would. The point being, it's all relative. If you put, once you put a number to it, now you know something. We're going to get in that when we do patient assessment and vital signs. And Glasgow Coma Score is a form of patient assessment. Asking someone if they're competent is a form of patient assessment. Judging competency is a form of patient assessment. Uh, they're slipping into a coma. We probably all are, right? Just at what rate are we slipping into it? You with me on that? All of us will probably be in a coma someday. Some will be really fast. Some will take years. How do I tell someone how much coma they're in? Well, the Glasgow Coma Score was designed to do just that. Once we establish a number, we have a baseline. And from that baseline is, is a person improving or disproving. So if I got the Glasgow of 10, the top score is 15. We're all 15s in here. Okay, we're all 15s. So if you're a 10, you know you're not quite there. And it's, it's based on eye-opening, verbal response, and motor movement. So how did you calculate the 10? Well, I don't, that's where it kind of falls apart. It's better to have a descriptor. Um, I don't ever want you to look at someone and give them a Glasgow Coma Score and tell me that's how bad they are. I want you to use a Glasgow Coma Score to say, upon seeing they were an 8, upon arrival at the ER they were a 6. That means they're degrading. Uh, it, it, we do the same thing with something called APGAR scoring. When a woman has a baby, it, it, one minute after birth, you give it a score with the top score 10. Five minutes after birth, you give the baby another score. Most babies are born at a seven. Five minutes, you hope they're a nine or a 10. You hope they're not a two. Does that make sense? So that, that's, that's the purpose of the Glasgow Coma Score, and it's really meant to be used in head trauma. That's why we don't speak of it until trauma. 
So if you come up to me and say, I have a patient with a Glasgow tent, I don't know anything other than they're not 15 and they're not my, nine. My, my question for that, you're saying Glasgow tent, uh -huh. 10, uh, times four, what would you do for like this? Okay, not not to be rude or crude, but someone who's paralyzed from the neck down is not going to get a Glasgow 15 because there's no motor movement. But are they you know? But but are they can they be competent even though they're paralyzed? Absolutely. Brings up a good point, and this is a good point to live in infamy and video. <laughs> Does it, he's dead now? But do, 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 do you know of the man who existed called Stephen Hawking? Who, who, who had a nod? You had a nod? Tell, tell those who may not know who, who or what he was. He was completely paralyzed and basically communicated with his uh, motor. With technology, yeah. Just a little bit of facial movement and eye movement and the computer tracked it and it would generate the words. What was he other than a paralyzed guy who talked with a computer? A very smart man. Noted. Yeah, he was a very smart man. He's a theoretical physicist. He held the position at Cambridge that our great mathematicians once had. Okay? Theoretical physicist. This man was so brilliant that he had an assistant because he couldn't write and document and do all those things. He had a mathematical assistant, somebody who's like super smart themselves, who was taking all the notes in, right? Taking all the thought processes. This guy can't do math on paper like we do, or at least I do. Especially advanced theoretical physicists and quantum mechanics and all that stuff. He did it in his head. And he would get those words out and things out with the aid of that computer. They say, you know, toward the end of his life there, he was six months ahead of the guy trying to transcribe it. He, had, he would have to pause and let him catch up. He was a conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, there's a conspiracy with anybody that's that smart. Um, brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, was it, was it ALS that he had, Luke Eriks? It was one of the neurodegenerative diseases. They're all kind of in the same category. He, he should have died in his 20s. The life expectancy of people who are diagnosed with that. Once he got diagnosed with it, he started practicing breathing exercises, like aggressively practicing breathing while he still could. And they say that's what gave the longevity that he had. Anyway, he died. But he was in a wheelchair. If you've ever seen the pictures of him, it was in a molded wheelchair because that's how his body was contracting up. He spoke with his eyes. I often challenge my students, if you found him in a nursing home, and you'll find people in nursing homes and long care facilities who are in those chairs or in those beds like that. I often wonder how you would treat him if you didn't know who he was. If you didn't know he was a theoretical physicist and he was in the home because he had to be, I often wonder how you would treat him. Would you speak? Would you tell him what you were about to do? Would you look at him like he was what some of us unfortunately call people just being in a vegetative state? And like there's no need to talk. What's his Glasgow? Three. Three. It's the lowest score you can get. And he's six months ahead in theoretical physics that no one else understands. And he died with theories that never got put down. You see where, the, see where it will fail? That's an extreme case of it failing. But once he opened up the avenue for consent by being able to communicate, was he able to give consent? Would you have told him, too bad, dude, I'm doing it anyway. But he's got a Glasgow of what? You get my point? Is he alert and oriented? Yeah, the things we haven't even seen. So you've got to be careful with those numbers. Uh, here's, here's where it applies more in a real world situation for me as a paramedic. I'll arrive on scene and there'll be a first responder there, a volunteer firefighter, somebody who's just going to the scene before I get there to stabilize. Great, wonderful. Need those kind of people. We really do. 
But undoubtedly, because they're lesser trained or may not have any experience or anything like that, I'll walk up to them and see my patient and there will be the first responder and they'll go, their pulse oximetry is 98 and their blood pressure is 114 over 68. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. During COVID, you could buy a pulse oximeter and people had them at home. And my mother-in-law would call the house. I'm at 96. Am I dying? Well, your daddy just smoked a cigarette and he's at 98. Yeah, it's carbon monoxide saturating the red blood cells, giving it a false reading. Anything over 94 is great. Are you having symptoms? No? You're okay. Put the, put the machine up. Put the COVID test down. Put the pulse oximeter <laughs> up. <laughs> Do you know that uh, men, I'm talking about biological men, I can go grab a thousand of them and pee on a pregnancy stick and I'll get some positives. Are they pregnant? No. I can go flu swab a thousand people without symptoms, new word alert, that's called asymptomatic. Any word that has A in front of it means without. So asymptomatic means without symptoms. I can go swab a thousand people for flu, I'll get positives. Do they have a flu? Not if they're asymptomatic. You could take a thousand women. 500 of them have normal regular periods and they haven't missed them. But some in that group will pay positive on a stick, but you haven't missed a period. Are they pregnant? Probably not. That's, that's the difference between, there, there, there's a concept called, it's hard for me to say, specificity. You've got to have the associated symptoms. And so back to our original thing, it's great that this first responder gave me a set of vital signs, but what do I want to see before I see the vital signs? The patient. Paramedics are real bad about this. Nurses are the worst about it in the hospital because they have this. If you've got anything to look at that tells me about my patient, I love this in, in our training. I'll put a heart rhythm up on the screen and, and the student will stand there and go, uh, that is, uh, and over here their patient's turning blue because they haven't looked at them. You know, you can not be breathing and have a great heart rhythm. Treat the patient, not the numbers, not the monitor. Treat the patient. I know without a doubt right now that all of you have a good blood pressure. I don't need to check it. Not yet. And we'll get into that. That's a primary assessment versus secondary assessment. Lord Kelvin said, at some point I gotta speak in numbers. I can't tell the doctor he has high blood pressure. I gotta tell the doctor it's 180 over 160. You with me? We'll get there. But, but it all comes from the same thing you're talking about, consent. And they have to be competent. And judging competency is sometimes harder than judging non-competency. So be careful. That's, that's your takeaway message. Be careful. Um, so we talked about some forms of consent. There is informed goes along with uh, expressed. In order for someone to give you consent, you also got to kind of inform them on what you're about to do. You walk up to them, who, are, who I am, here's why I'm here, what can I do for you, here's what I think we need to do. I think we're kind of cool on that. Implied consent, this is someone who is incapacitated to the point where they can't directly express things. Sign language would be a form of expression. Any language model that you can interpret is a form of expression. Without that language model, we must rely on implied consent. If you are able to communicate with me, I think this is what most reasonable and prudent would say with their uh, leg cut off, unconscious. Most people would want me to help, so I'm just gonna go with it. You with me? Minor consent. We kind of already talked about that in local parentis, in place of the parent. We need a parent, legal guardian, Aunt Becky's Uncle Sue's sister, watching the kids, gotta be careful with that. Most people who babysit don't sign contracts for in local parentis. 
why are you, 17-year-old sister, watching the five-year-old niece or nephew? The parents are on a date and they ask God to babysit. And I called 911. If it's a life-threatening condition, no problem, go with the child. If it's not life-threatening, I would not transport that child until I talk to the legal guardian. And in today's world, that's too easy. 30 years ago when I was in the field, they're at a concert. We're not getting a hold of them. There are, you know, weren't cell phones everywhere. Does that make sense to you? Make the best effort to contact the parent. I guess if you played it up enough, you can say a fractured wrist is a life-threatening condition. It certainly is if they're a hemophiliac. If they got a bleeding disorder, it's hard to control their bleeding. Yeah. But he fell off the monkey bars at school. We're going to sit here until we get a hold of a parent. School's got in local parenthesis. I'm still going to try to get a hold of the parent. At least to tell them where I'm taking them. What if the parent is in direct contact with you and you can prove with, with certainty, with a reasonable degree of certainty, that the parent says, you're not going to transport them. We're only 10 minutes out. We just picked up our groceries. We'll be there to school in a minute to pick them. Will you sit and wait? Huh? Yeah, if it's not life-threatening, I'll sit and wait. That's reasonable, isn't it? That's reasonable. I don't want them to go to the ER. I'd rather just take them to the pediatrician straight or something like that. Be reasonable. Reasonable and prudent. And then involuntary consent. Uh, involuntary consent is when the state's taken over. They're under arrest. <laughs> they have a court order that says they need to be under the will of the state. So we have to be careful with that one. We're going to get into this as we go through this a little bit deeper as well. Issues of consent and refusal. I, I mentioned earlier about a, a, a if they will, if they wrote it down while they were able to have sound judgment, and then they went unconscious or they became incapacitated. What they had written down in advance still rules. These are called advanced directives. Some people call them living wills. Um, some people call it uh, do not resuscitate. Well, do not resuscitate form has its own little issue, but they're all forms of advanced directives. This is another one of those where I bet you have a, I thought I knew versus now I know. Self-determination is called autonomy. We already defined autonomy. Documents the wish of the chronically terminally ill patient not be resuscitated. I just said to you earlier, are we all not terminally ill? I have no health conditions. I'll, I'll go ahead and share a little bit of my health issues. I have no health conditions. But could I go ahead and write a DNR? I could. I probably wouldn't get physicians signing it because they're like, dude, why wouldn't you want to be resuscitated? It sounds like you got a mental problem now. You're, you're healthy. Why wouldn't you want to be resuscitated? But if I started suffering from severe COPD or one of the four horsemen that you guys have identified and we'll talk about tomorrow, would I go in and say, hey, doc, I, you know, I've been intubated five times because of breathing difficulty. I've been admitted to the hospital. And, and he or she says, you know, I, I get you. I understand your concerns. If you don't want to ever be resuscitated, if you go into cardiac arrest, let's, let's get the documents drawn up. I have that right to say what's going to happen to me if something goes wrong. Now that's resuscitation, that's CPR. I can back that out a little bit and say, I'll go, to, you can put me in the hospital, but don't give me any medications. You can put me in the hospital, but if I can't eat, don't force feed me. Don't feed me through a tube. I don't want to be fed through a tube. Or you may say, if I'm incapacitated, let me die naturally, but don't let me starve. I mean, you can just pick and choose what you want done to you. And that's called the living will or the advanced directive. Does that make sense? So one of the questions I often get into this um, is, oh, there are many. There are many. Maybe I should pause and see if you have some already to hit, hit, hit the point directly. 
someone has a DNR and you don't know it? If someone has a DNR and you don't know it and you attempt resuscitation, are you in trouble? No. no. Once it's produced, what if you walked into the home, man, on, man fell out of the recliner, no pulse, no respiration, you start CPR, as you should. Daughter comes in and says, oh, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. Dad did not want to be resuscitated. He's got the papers over here in his nightstand. You just keep going. Show me the papers. She hands you the papers. What do you do? They are. Stop. I don't know where this comes from in this business, but I've heard people say, no, once you start, you got to keep going. No. You don't have to keep going. Your textbooks won't say this. What if you peel back the clothing and go to do compressions on their chest and this person was so adamant about not having that paper with them at all times? I mean, would you really want to carry that paper around all the time? You can put it on what they call a medic alert bracelet or necklace. I'll be honest, I picked up a lot of people and I just failed to look at their necklaces to see if that meant anything. But I'll tell you what, if I pulled their shirt off and it said, do not resuscitate in red tattoo ink across their chest, you got my attention. I'm asking. The courts have said that's cool. The courts look at it like if this person goes through the expense and the pain of getting a tattoo on their chest, I think that's what they want. Does that not sound right? Would I rather have a notarized original form? Uh, absolutely. What about a copy of the original form? Pro. Gus, will that work? Pro. If the tattoo would work, I think a copy of the form would work. What if you're doing that, there's no document, there's no tattoo, and every family member in the house is saying, I don't know where the paper is, but I'm telling you he did not want this done. And there's 100% agreement in that household with all six family members going, I promise you he didn't want this done. You're legally bound too, aren't you? What do you think would happen if you called the physician and said, I have an 88 year old patient we're currently doing CPR on. Family states he's a DNR, but I have no proof or documentation whatsoever of that. They are in 100% agreement that he did not want to be resuscitated. His past medical history included pancreatic cancer with comorbidity of diabetes. Check your little signs if you don't find anything. Called what do you think the doctor is going to do? What advice do you think they'll give? He'll probably ask or she'll probably ask something like, are there any signs of life? And you're like, nope. There's no, they're in, they're asystolic. They don't have a heart rhythm. There's no pulse. They're not breathing. Their pupils are fixed. Stop. They're probably going to tell you to stop. They're probably going to tell you to stop. Can they? And what do you do with everything that you just heard? Write it down. Document, document, document. Those are special cases. But you know what, guys? We don't, you ever heard of those saying, there's the textbook way and then there's the way in the field? Eh, I don't buy into that. They're just special cases that we can't, we can't write a book about everything that might crop up. And that's why you're in here. Any, any other questions about DNRs? So uh, part of your homework assignment over the next week or two is uh, I want you to go online and do a Google search for the Texas out of hospital DNR form. Out of hospital. Now there is an in hospital DNR form as well. And the intent of the in hospital DNR form is while you're admitted to the hospital. And that is only meant to work while you're in the hospital. If you are making a transfer from one hospital to the other, they're still in the concept of the hospital. And so that form would still apply. 
But if they've been discharged last week and they're sitting in their house and that's the only DNR form they have, that's not, we need an out of hospital. Are you with me? The in hospital DNR form is really meant, hey, we're gonna take you to heart surgery. It's gonna be, it's high risk. Uh, what do you what do you want what do you want to happen if something goes wrong in there? Now, if you survive that heart surgery, you may not want that DNR when you go home. Is that are you with me on that? So that's the difference between an in hospital and out of hospital DNR form. I don't think the slides mention this, so I will hospice someone who's on hospice. You know what hospice is? Chas? Mm -hmm. Chas, tell me what it is since you nodded yes. Um, that's when a patient is... I'm, I'm getting close so I pick up your audio. Oh, <laughs> oh that changed everything, didn't it? I just don't want to get in your bubble without your permission. It's where a patient is deemed to be close to death by sure. a terminal illness. Yeah, yeah, she's right. You've got an illness, you're gonna die from it, and the doctors say, it'll, usually a two or more, say, yeah, probably within six months. So you gotta put a timeline to it at six months. If you're still alive at six month mark, you have to requalify for hospice. And they send out usually a hospice worker who goes in and says, they're not any better or they're worse, they just haven't died yet. Yeah, we'll requalify them for hospice. Do, do all hospice patients have DNRs? What do you think? So if this patient is deemed to die within six months, do you think they are also DNR patients? Most of the time they are. They don't have to be. Some people believe in miracles. Some people are on experimental treatments. Don't assume, the point of that is, don't assume just because they're on hospice that they are a DNR. What should you do if you get called to a hospice patient? Ask a call for Do what? Ask a call to see if they have a DNR. Okay, so, yeah, I would like to know that. Talk to the hospice nurse. If they're sick, you can still give them meds. Yeah. Let me give you an example and deal with that easier. Uh, 72 year old woman's on hospice due to bone cancer, some form of cancer or something. You know, that sounds pretty terminal. She falls out of bed and breaks her hip. Uh, family's there with her. Hospice nurse just left a minute or two ago, won't be back till this afternoon. She calls 911. And you get there and you're like, yep, that's a broken hip, obviously, because it's like rotated around. You're like, oh, that, that doesn't, that's deformed. Can't really say it's broken. We don't have x-ray vision, but it's certainly deformed. It's broken. It's broken. Um, do you splint her and take her to the hospital? Yes. Yeah. No. Call the hospice nurse. Call the hospice nurse. Mm -hmm. I know. Get them off the floor? Sure. Put them back in bed? Sure. Splint and transport? Probably not. If you don't know what they're being, they don't know what kind of medication they're on that the hospice nurse is prescribed either. The hospice nurse is, uh, you know, when you in, enter into hospice, they have the decision ability of all that and everything. So let's just say you did take her to the hospital and you took her in there and the doctor found, or the, you know, the team found out that she was a hospice patient. Are they going to do surgery on her hip? No. Why would you put someone through that when they're going to die anyway? That doesn't mean you can't do comfort measures. That doesn't mean if you were a paramedic you couldn't give pain meds. And most hospice patients have what they call a comfort kit. Get in there, relieve distress or stuff like that. The problem is if you go to the hospital while on hospice, you come off of hospice. And you have to requalify to get back on hospice. And plus you'd put yourself through a whole lot of something in order to... What if they messed up and aspirated while they were eating and got a bunch of fluid in their lungs? Are they going to be admitted to ICU for treatment of aspiration pneumonia? Probably not. Probably not. It's dying with dignity. 
that's dying with dignity. You hit it right on the money. There will be a big binder next to that patient. I've never been in a hospice situation. I've never found the big binder. There will be a binder that says, such and such hospice company, call, and they'll answer. Please call and get further orders and advice. Doesn't hurt to call your medical control, but if, 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 if my med control or my medical director is working a, uh, you know, if Dr. Keelan is working a multi-systems trauma in two rooms at the hospital, I really don't want to go get him and say, hey, doc, I need some advice. I've got this little old lady who fell out of bed and broke her hip and she's on hospice. He's going to drop the phone and say, what are you doing bugging me? die with dignity okay so like I said it's not necessarily in the book it's not necessarily on the slides but it is something that usually goes along hand in hand with DNR what if you uh, yes. like can't get somebody on the phone and uh, like it's a life or death situation uh, uh, do they have a DNR or not um, and you can't get them on the phone then it would be a medical director call but um, I no hospice company's not going to answer a phone. They wouldn't last very long. But it could, could happen. You could, you know, cell phone batteries, you know, whatever. We come up with hypotheticals all day long. You do the best you can. But, yeah, it, it, if all else fails, you've got med, med, med advice. Or maybe even, a, you know, you can involve your supervisors, too. They're usually more experienced. Or, yeah, you get out in Fannin County, there's places you can't call. They're stacking the patient's best interest. And that's why I need to tell you these things. If you take that patient to the hospital, they're coming off hospice, and they're probably not going to get treatment. And they were going to die anyway. But we all are, too. My, my experience with uh, hospice patients, if they have the comfort kit, use it. Yeah. Use it. You can get it. The, the family can give it. I would probably talk to the family and say, hey, if you use the comfort kit, don't, do you not have instructions for this? Sometimes they just need that little nudge. It's like, I didn't know I could. Like, That's what it's here for. And then I've even heard these words, and don't go quoting me on this, but I've heard words like, be liberal with it. Use the damn thing. Uh, my dad was on hospice due to lung slash liver cancer that had metastasized to his lung. One way or the other, I don't remember exactly which way. When it didn't matter, he went in, and they're like, you got this, and he's like, you're not doing anything. The doctor said, that's, that's good advice. You just gave yourself good advice. I do not recommend it. We can if we want to. He's like, no, uh-uh. And the doctor said, I agree with you. Let's go on hospice. I mean, that is a bunch of bam, 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 bam with family, right? But I remember the night he, he got up to go to the bathroom and he couldn't get his pants pulled back up and he was getting agitated and really mad and falling and stuff. Mom calls me. She's like, you got to help me get him in bed. I live close enough that I would be there way before hospice. All we needed to put his clothes on, kind of clean him up a little bit and put him in bed. And he was just mad and agitated. Well, understandably so. He's dying. His son's having to pull his underwear up. I mean, you just imagine. He was relatively young, 63. So, you know, just he just wasn't ready for it. Nobody was. He was just agitated, though. And mom said, they've got that medicine over there in that box. Do you think we should use it? And I said, what do they have? And I went over and looked, and they had Ativan. Ativan, which is a Zanny. It's all in the same class. It's a Valium. It's a Xanax. It's an Ativan. Good stuff. It's a sedative. It's an anxiolytic, Jordan, new term alert. Anxiolytic. You ready? Somebody's not coming back tomorrow. They're like, oh, my God. It's easy, guys. It really is easy. Just bear with me. Anxio looks like anxiety, doesn't it? Comes from the Greek word angst. Angst. To be worked up. I think there's a passage in the Bible that says, leave your worries to me. I think in the, one of the original interpretations of it is, leave your angst. Give up your angst. Give up your anxiety. I got this. Today we call it value. Anxiolytic. L-Y-T-I-C. If you see the word lytic or the other form of that word lice, 
think of Lysol, the disinfectant spray. It's a trade name for the chemical that they use to kill bacteria and viruses, right? It kills them by lysing them. To lyse them means to split them open and get rid of them. And so they just played on the word, and now they market Lysol. Everybody knows what Lysol is, but not everybody knows what lice is. Not the insects. To lice means to get rid of. Get rid of what? Anxiety. So anxiolytics do what? Get rid of anxiety. I'm going to have you do a, a, a homework assignment when we do pharmacology that says what are the top 10 most per commonly prescribed drugs in the United States. That list has changed with the advent of GLP-1s. <laughs> We're in fine shape, guys. We're going to talk about this tomorrow. Um, but on that list are also the anxiolytics. Everybody gets a zanny, right? Doc, I just can't handle the test. Take one of these, you can. My wife's driving me crazy. Take one of these, you can. Everybody suffers from anxiety. Why? We'll talk about that tomorrow. Ativan's an anxiolytic. There was some in that kit. My mom said, you think we should use it? And I said, I think that's what it's there for. It's called Better Life Through Chemistry. I said, but I'm going to tell you something, Mom. And I said it right in front of him. And he's still fighting. I mean, he's mad. He's abnormally anxious. Yeah, understandably so. The cancer's spreading. He's sick. He doesn't feel good. I said, there's a high probability that when I give him this... He's going to go to sleep. He's going to go to sleep, but he may stay asleep. It kind of sounds weird, doesn't it? it? Kind of sounds weird. But my experience with that was talking. So I gave him the Ativan, and he went to sleep, and he was calm. He was calm for three days before he died. He never woke back up. I'm not saying that's what the Ativan done, but he got to calm down. And made, I'm going to assume made peace in his own brain. You know, he, he was resting. He wasn't fighting to be alive anymore. And that's harsh. You can make that sound harsh, but gosh, doesn't that sound so much better than fighting me till you die? And that's what those comfort kits are for. It's, they may not be anxiolytics in there. They may be uh, analgesics, which are painkillers. And be, just give them the morphine. Just give them the morphine. Hospice patients are different. Hospice patients really should not be our patients. So that should be your first question. Like, why did you call me? You're not supposed to call me. You're supposed to call hospice. We're going to call hospice. Family freaks out. And we tell them on everything we own to call 911. Always, always made a joke about that. People call 911 for the craziest things. Well, you told them to. It's all over everything you got. You don't even say in an emergency. You, some of them just say call 911. Say hi. How you doing? So we talked about these. Uh, a couple of more terms we need to get out of this. Healthcare power of attorney or proxy. The word proxy means to project upon someone else. Healthcare by proxy means I'm going to let old Gus over there tell caregivers how to treat me, what I want and what I don't want. Upon your death or upon your incapacitation, I should say, who's going to take control of your medical decisions? Do you know that answer now? If you were to become incapacitated right now, who would make the decisions for you? idea? Closest. Closest living relative. And there's usually a hierarchy of that. Parents or spouse, depending on you know if you're married or not. Grandparents, aunts and uncles and nieces and stuff. It gets kind of funny out there in the end, but that's the only surviving relative. Or someone by the court who's deemed you as um, you're a foster child and you're in foster care. Usually the state's going to step back into that in that case, though. But you got to be careful with that. Or you can identify that right now. 
group of paramedic buddies and I, we take an annual trip to a um, place up in Oklahoma and in the, around Thanksgiving, camp out, spend a few nights, kind of catch up, guys we haven't seen in years. Done a lot of calls together. You know, good times, right? We had a conversation one night. Of who We've talked about living wills, and we should all have one because we're aging. Who do you deem in that living will of having the power or the proxy for your health care decisions? And we tossed that around a little bit, and almost all of us that were married said, I guess our wives. And somebody said, I don't know if that's the greatest idea. <laughs> I don't know if that's the greatest idea. Now, some of them said it for that reason that you laughed at. I thought about it for a moment and go, well, I'm twofold on this. One, I don't want my wife to have to make those decisions. There's too many emotions involved. That's tough for her to have to do. And I came up with the concept of, why don't I just have a committee of these guys sitting around me right now? What about the three of you have a, have a, have a deal? It's got to be an odd number. Can't have a tie. And the three of you make the decisions on what's going to happen because you're informed. You know what it is. You know the outcomes. You know the odds. You're familiar with it. Do you really want somebody non-medical whatsoever making your decisions? You may. That's your personal choice. That's the idea between advanced directives, living wills, proxy, durable power of attorney. And you have that autonomy to name that person. Okay? Some of you aren't even thinking about it because the average age of this class is 19. I don't even have it named. I, I should. Every physical I take, the first question the, the nurse and the doctor ask me, do you have a living will? Who is your medical power of attorney? What that means for the EMT. When you arrive on scene and you've got a question, who has medical power of attorney? They're, the family's probably not familiar with the word proxy. They might be, but probably not. Medical power of attorney is not the same as the power of attorney who's going to execute a will or name, named an executor in a trust. That's, that's, that's a legal power of attorney. We're talking about medical power of attorney. They're often not the same person. Okay? Validity of the document, interpret the orders. We already talked about the conflicts. We already talked about what to do. If in doubt, go ahead and start until you get the document. We talked about refusals. You've seen nothing in here about A and O times three, four. We talked about being an influence of drugs of alcohol or having a head injury or anything like that. They have to understand. That's a, that's a good take-home point right there, guys. Your patients have to understand the consequences of what you're going to do. I mean, when you go in for surgery to get an ingrown toenail removed, I probably signed a document that says you may die. <laughs> like, wait a minute. It's just a toenail removal. Like, well, you may die. I just got to inform you of that. But you also have to... Um, understand what we're about to do for you. So it's a two-way street, okay? You have to inform them, they have to inform you. They have to understand. You know if I leave you right now and don't take you to the hospital, your condition may get worse. Uh, you got to document the heck out of this or you'll get in trouble. It's like, he didn't tell me it would get worse or I'd have went with him. I'm telling you, if you do a refusal correctly, it would be easier just to take the patient. If you do it correctly, it would be easier to take the patient. I got in a situation one time where I had a non-English speaking woman in a car accident. I didn't think she was hurt. I, I, she didn't want to go, but was there a barrier to the communication? I don't, I, I don't speak Spanish. She didn't speak good English. There was a barrier. When I called the medical control physician and said, we're going to leave this scene and she's not wanting to go, he's like, put her on the phone. I speak Spanish. And I'm like, she already drove off. <laughs> <laughs> back up, back up. We, um, yeah, get an interpreter. And now you got Google Translate. Your, you should have no excuse like I had. But I was, I was being lazy. And she didn't want to go. Come to find out, she really didn't want to go. But because there was a barrier there, it wasn't clean on the documentation. You with me? 
be careful. Patient must sign the release form. Hey, like I told you, if I'm in the backyard and you're interrupting my afternoon nap, I may not sign your form. I am not going to, I'm not going to fight somebody to get a signature. In that case, police officer, partner, bystanders, witnesses, document, document, document. There are people who will not sign their name to any form that they didn't ask for. Do you blame them? I really don't blame them. I was fine until you got here. I did not have an issue until you got here. Now we're in an argument. And I'm not signing your form. You're probably going to send me a bill, right? How many of you don't even do something on the internet because you don't want it going to your email now? There are news channels. I will not look at their articles because I don't want to put my email in. You just you lost me because you're asking. I don't. You don't need my email for me to read your news. That's how these patients feel when you're up there trying to force an issue up on them. Be reasonable. Be reasonable. This is just a, a more of a checklist of what you would do if you um, had a refusal. If a patient really needs to go, but they're still refusing, you need to get help. All the way up to court order involvement, an, an emergency detention situation. Oh my gosh, those are terrible. I've only had a few of those, but you sit on scene forever, and you're like, you really don't need to be left alone. You're not, you, you've got some psychological issues that you're, I can't trust you to be left alone. You've already attempted some weird things, but you're competent. Up until the point where I had a young girl say, hey, I've been detained in the psychiatric center. You eat three meals a day and say, yes, ma'am, they'll kick you out in three days. It's, I, send me there if you want, but I'm, no. Oh, my God, God. Can't even threaten her with that. She's already done that. Um, so I had to get an emergency court order, and it takes a while. And judges are the ones who have to sign off on that, and the police officer is involved. Nobody wants to do this. But if it's the right thing to do for the patient, stick with it, okay? So you can get up to that moment where you have to uh, do that. And always leave them with the out, the out. You can call us back if you change your mind. Always leave them with that. I'll always come back if you change your mind. Okay. We got time to do negligence. Um, almost. We got time to identify the four points in negligence and we'll clean this up tomorrow and we'll be done with it. Um, as you can see, there are 27 slides in this presentation, but we don't have to do it like that. So what is negligence? All of you guys have been building up to that, right? All of you have been building up to it. Like if I miss anything up that you just talked about for the last three hours, I can be deemed negligent. That's If, if you're in trouble in legal land, you're probably in trouble here. Negligence. Lucky for you, I guess, the courts, the prosecution, have to prove four things to be true in order for you to be deemed negligence. And I'm going to throw out the old ding ding right now. Ding ding comes from an old class I took on overheads. You know what overheads are? It's the transparency film that's projected on the screen through this weird lens looking thing. We have PowerPoint now. So these transparencies, when he would lay them on the overhead projector, if it had a little bell in the corner, it was test material. It was going to be on the test. So I've just adopted that and I just go ding ding. So if you ever hear me go ding ding, probably need to grill it down. This is ding ding. Four things needed to be proof proven to prove negligence. There they are. Once, once again, just to get you in rhythm, ding, ding. Four things must be proven in order for you to be deemed negligent. Lucky for you, you already know what they are. You just didn't know they all went together. Number one, the EMT had a duty to act. If you had no duty to act, can't be negligent. Okay? 
if, if, if a judge, a jury, a lawyer, a courtroom, whoever, can knock one of these four out, you're not negligent. Does that make sense? The EMT breached the duty to act. Quick example. Uh, you didn't want to you didn't want to delay the scrambled eggs you cooked for breakfast. You waited. You waited till the scrambled eggs were consumed before you made the call. Gus, sounds like get something you might do, huh? Got to have my protein. The patient suffered harm or injury. So you were supposed to go to this um, stomach pain call, but you didn't because you wanted to eat so you wouldn't have stomach pain. And because you delayed, that had to be the reason they were injured. That's called proximate cause. My delay, Gus's delay, caused the injury. If you can get a physician or a subject matter expert to say, that guy was going to have that injury regardless of what time they got there, you're not negligent. You're not off the hook. But you're not negligent. Once again, Gus, you're not off the hook, but you are not negligent. You say only takes one or four. You, you can talk any one of those four off and it's over. Negligence is over. So if I didn't stop on the side of the road and that patient died, they did die. It wasn't my fault. You can't get me for negligence. How come? Well, one, I didn't have a duty to act, so th therefore I had no duty to breach. Number two, me driving off was not the cause of them dying. That make sense? Yeah. Me driving on by them did not cause them to die. We'll, we'll speak more about this soon, like tomorrow. So in the remaining time we have, uh, I want to answer that one parking lot question. Uh, I think it's a good question. I, don't, I think it was signed. I don't know who signed it. And Regan, I was thinking that maybe in these scenarios, when I read these, we could just add a line in the module or make a module that says parking lot questions. Just... Kind of like a FQA, or no, it's FAQ, isn't it? FAQ. So this is just a question that's not necessarily on topic, but needs to be addressed. I don't. I, I'm not going to make out who said it. It doesn't matter. What is your best advice for when we go to clinicals to stay efficient in an emergency situation, rather than in the way, rather than being in the way and delaying EMS? Great question. And I, I know where that comes from. That comes from the same concept of people who are afraid they won't know what to do and uh, in an emergency situation. I've often been asked, how do you know, how do you handle it? Well, you handle it because you know what to do. By the time you get to clinical, yes, you're going to be apprehensive. Yes, you're going to be shy. Yes, you're going to be timid. Your faculty, your preceptors, your intern people, they all know this because they were there in your position as well. Um, so I think the answer looks something like this. One, you're going to know what to do. Two, you're going to know your own limitations. Three, the, the people around you will know your limitations. I promise you, if you walk into an EMS agency, I'm an EMT student. I'm an EMT student and I'm scared to death. Just say it. Just let them know up front. I'm an EMT student and I am freaking out. You don't know what the first call will be and they don't either. There may be a call where they freak out. They will probably turn to you and go, what are you comfortable doing? Here's, what, here's how this is going to work. When we make the first call, if you, if you can take vital signs, that's, that's awesome. That saves me a step. So when we get there and I tell you to get vital signs, I want you to take their blood pressure, pulse, and respirations. Can you do that? Gain a little confidence. Hey, 
we're going to a call. We know the nature of the call. It's CPR in progress. I know that's a high stressful situation for you possibly because you may not have ever seen a dead person. Here's what I want you to do when we get there. Let me clearly define what I need you to do when we get there. Um, I need you to take that bag. You see that green bag in the back? Carry that bag in with us. Do you know what a bag valve mask is? And by that time you will. When we ask for that, do it. Are you comfortable squeezing the bag? If you can squeeze the bag, awesome. That's all I'll have you do because that frees me up to do something else. Are you good with chest compressions? Think you can do some chest compressions today? If you can do chest compressions, you got them all. Just tell them what you can do and be upfront and honest with them. Say, I'm kind of freaking out today. Trust me, they can get a call where they freak out too. And if, if it's mass chaos, they will tell you, stand here, don't move. I got too much going on to have to watch out for you too. And I, I've been in that position myself as, a, as an ambulance attendant. I've had patients I go up, or students I go up and grab, and like, you're not going in there. And they're like, no, I want to see it. I said, no, you don't. If you get told that, don't force the issue. A lot of times it's crime scene. I'm, I'm not letting you in there because I don't want you to have to go to court and testify on what, what you saw in there and I'm gonna document my report. The student was with, the student did not enter the room. Some, you know, there's a thousand scenarios we can come up with. Does, I hope that answered the question and if it, if it didn't, then continue. It probably didn't make you feel any better, but you'll get better. You'll get better any others so I want to finish up negligence tomorrow it won't take long and then I want to get into the health and well-being of the paramedic and you should have your food diary in progress I'm already on to somebody back there not you Jordan not you everybody's ducking he's turning his head scratching I'm, I've got an eye out for you I know what's going on I seen the I seen the four horsemen list the other day. Heart disease or cardiovascular disease was that on your list? Neurological, Neurological diseases, <laughs> cancers, metabolic disorders, and type two falls under that. The majority of the work you'll do in this field is that. That's what kills people. Take trauma out. That's what kills people. Cardiovascular disease cancers, metabolic, neurological. They are all from diet. They are all from, not 100%, but they're all from diet. Back up 60 years, that was not the list. Okay. If, if you don't believe me, just back up 60 years, that was not the list. Back up 100 years, it sure wasn't even close to the top of the list. Back up 10,000 years, they were unheard of. Segway for tomorrow. Any further questions before we call it a day? Looking forward to tomorrow. Everybody coming back. Big words didn't scare you off. We ain't not got the big ones yet. These are baby words. All right, guys. Thank you.